This week, we welcome back WA Reel's first ever guest, Paul Newsom, founder of Swim Smooth, who opens up on his recent experience and realization of being a workaholic and the impact that has had on him and the people around him. Paul, a very driven and competitive man, very candidly shares how the reoccurrence of a major back injury minutes before departing on a family holiday was the entry into a very dark period that has brought about some very significant revelations about the manner in which he's been living life and the required changes that he's beginning to make. We cover a variety of topics, including the importance of sleep, how we carry stories from our childhood that shape how we live as adults, the nature of being a very achievement focused person and how we don't necessarily listen to those closest to us. The beauty of this conversation is that it freshly captures a superb example of someone waking up to the control and impact of the events and stories that lie deep within us. It captures how if left unchecked, these events and stories can take such a grip on us and how we navigate life that it takes something major to bring them to life and shake us out of it. I've got a lot of time for Paul. I love being around him and his energy and I love what he's created with Swim Smooth. And what is clear by the end of this conversation is that this just may be the best thing that may have happened to Paul and his future with Swim Smooth, despite being such a personally painful experience. So enjoy, Paul. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Today's guest is an old friend of the show. In fact, he was my very first podcast guest, Mr. Paul Newsom. Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Bryn. It's great to be here. So I, I can't help, before we get into the story, reminiscing on the first time I ever did a podcast. It was with yourself, and I have to be honest with you, I was shitting bricks before you turned <laughs> um, I'm slightly more calm in nowadays, and hopefully you'll find the whole experience a lot more polished and to the point. Sure. So I hope so, after 100-odd episodes. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, You're doing really well with that. I need shooting. So there you go. So the last time we spoke, uh, you were telling me about your journey to Australia, um, starting off with swim DVDs, selling them out the back, uh, the creation of Swim Smooth, or very nearly Swim Fresh, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Or Swim Clean, even. <laughs> swim yeah. Clean, I remember. <laughs> um, was writing the swimming syllabus for the ITU, uh, the swimming around Manhattan and winning that. Um, there's creating these Swim Smooth coaches all around the world. Uh, hot Mrs. Great Family. All of the things. And uh, I, m- one of my big lasting imprints on, on, on me of doing that was just the passion for you as a swim coach and what you did. And um, I think one of the questions right at the very end where you just said, look, my biggest worry is that I just can't do coaching anymore. And uh, it was it was really awesome. And then um, a couple of weeks ago, like we've seen each other socially and stuff like this. And a couple of weeks ago, he rang me up and said, well, sent me a text and rang me up and said, hey, I want to come back on the show. Um, things have been... Well, you know, faced adversity and some you know, serious learnings, which we'll dive into in a minute. But first question I wanted to ask was, why did you feel it important to come back and tell the story? I think you touched on a really good point there with this whole idea of being very passionate and, um, and you know, having a passion for what I do day to day. Um, ironically enough, our Facebook profile is Swim Smooth, the world's most passionate swim coaching. Mm. Now, I've just finished reading a book, which we'll probably deal, delve into, called um, Ego is the Enemy. And one of the chapters in that book talks about the idea of passion not necessarily being the greatest of um, key elements for somebody in terms of it can sort of overtake a lot of your life in many ways. And sometimes having processes and plans and being able to sit back and, and sort of see the bigger picture sometimes can be a better process than just being, just feel like you're just surviving on passion. There's only so long you can survive on passion according to this book. Mm. And, you know, I've just, we've just been sat down there talking about uh, emails and stuff and my little notes up on the top here, an email which I was talking about um, wanting to send out to my triathlon squad, my swimming squad, was one about telling them why um, I might have to take a bit of a step back uh, in the short term because of a back injury which I've been suffering from. And the whole title of the um, of the email there was going to be When Passion Turns to Addiction. <laughs> right. And you know, I, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why I reached out to you was I just wanted to sort of share this idea that, you know, I... 
for my entire life, I have been a very, uh, I've been driven. Uh, I've driven myself to, to want to succeed and to want to build things and do better and be better with myself mm. and all these sort of things, which a lot of people think would be quite commendable. But I guess I want to sort of share some of the ideas and things that realizations that I've come to about maybe I've overstepped that mark and maybe I've been overstepping that mark for years mm. and how that might have affected some of my relationships, both at home and friends and these sort of things. And um, <clears throat> just, also joining the dots as well about why I keep getting injured, like physical injuries. You know, mm. what is that related to? Is it related to the to the to the workload? And um, you know, I wanted to start off the, the the whole the first line of this email was going to be, "My name is Paul Newson, and I'm a workaholic." <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I've I've never it's like sitting in an AA. Yeah, thing, isn't it? exactly, oh, exactly. You know, I, I was advised don't put that out because it sounds a little bit cheesy and stuff. But I guess it, it was just. Part of that first line was really just me coming to terms and coming to grips with what a lot of people have been telling me over the years that, you know, you work these crazy hours, you're up every morning at four o'clock, you're on the pool deck six days a week, you know, getting up at four o'clock every single morning. And how do you do it? How do you manage to fit all of this in? You know, it, a lot of people use the words, it's amazing how you can just get away with four or five hours a night sleep every night and you've mm. been doing it for 15 years. Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, exactly right. And, um, you know, the, the crazy thing with that is the more I was actually hearing that from people, the more it sort of boosts me and it almost makes you feel like, oh, Superman, you know, if everyone thinks I'm amazing because I, can can, I can suffer this workload, then I must, be, I must be doing something right. And it must be, you know, people who may be admiring what I'm doing. But the, the gross reality of it is that it can only go on for so long. And I think yeah. I've, in the last, well, four months ago, actually, I had a bit of a breaking point um, and it's caused me to stop a little bit and reflect on, on where I'm at with things. And, and that, those, some, some of those things are what I'd like to really share with your listeners mm. today, Brian. And, and talk about you know you know some of the conclusions I've come to and how it can maybe help somebody potentially stop going down that path. And yeah, it, it's, I say that though because you know my wife have been we've been married or been together now for sixteen years, and for the last sixteen years, especially when we started Swim Smooth fifteen years ago, she's been seeing this gradual build and it getting bigger and more successful mm. and bigger and bigger and bigger on all these sort of things. And she's always been the one in my ear saying. I think you need to step back a little bit. I think you need to, you're working too much, you know, mm. I don't see enough of you and stuff. And, and of course, me thinking, that's what I want to do. I want to build it and I want to get more successful and stuff like that. This very sort of ego, maniacal mm. sort of um, uh, view on it all. You know, some of it is, is obviously very, very genuine. Some of it's I want to build a successful life for me and my family, mm. you know, but without realising and recognising how working the long hours that I did do was obviously causing um, a gap or a um, you know a rift to yes. sort of develop over the years and and you know like I say Michelle's been telling me this for years that this is this needs to calm down a little bit and it's not until I've actually gone through the process of literally hitting a brick wall myself and um, and having to stop that I've actually started to look at some of the stuff she's been telling me to look at for 16 <laughs> years and you know none of none of what I've learned in in the last few months is nothing new to what she's been telling me mm. but it's taken me to go through that process myself and so I guess what I'm trying to say there Bryn is that as much as I might talk about some of this stuff now I'm hoping it's going to be fuel for thought for some of your yes. listeners yeah but I can't profess to sort of saying that I'm going to be able to save you all and no. you're all going to... You, Look, WRL is path. not about saving people. Um, I think we had a brief discussion just before we switched the microphone on. Um, more and more, I think it's about normalising the stories, normalising the real things that are going on for people. Um, you know, the difference between the Instagram post and the reality. You know, the difference between, oh, look at him, he's got... You know, he's got the family, he's got the following, he's got the company. What's really going on? That's right. Yeah. That's exactly and, right, yeah. And, you know, for a while now, I have this idea that, um, you know, there are four games in life we play. Health and well-being, relationships, business and production, and connection to something bigger than yourself. And you're only as strong as your weakest game. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can meet a lot of highly spiritual people who can't pay the iPhone bill. Yeah. Very successful people who have... The shitty wedding, relationship, or whatever, relationship, yeah, yeah. You know, the super buff guy who's morally devoid, yeah, you know, or the super, super awesome dad who's fat and overweight and can't yes. play with kids. You know, yeah. you're only as strong as, as your weakest game, you're not as strong as your strongest game. And so that's why, for me, I was when you reached out, I was so touched, right? Uh, A, that you chose me to come and talk to me about this, yeah. but also because it's another story 
and I feel passionately that more of these need to be out there just so we understand it not so we give people a box to climb into and no, go no. oh you know poor me where is me because yeah, it's not yeah. about that shit no 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 but it, yeah. it is recognising 100% where you are today totally, and why yeah, have you got here do you want it to continue or do you want to yeah, go yeah. on a new trajectory and, and that's a big thing about what it's about yeah. so tell me about the trigger event yeah, I, I think that's a very good place to start. I was thinking before you came, I was thinking, where are we going to start this and how are we going to go through it? I like to think very chronologically yeah. about stuff, but it makes sense to start with that, with that well, trigger yeah. event. Really. I'm the host, yeah. let me do the host. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess, I, I, guess you know, I, I am prone to wandering and going off on tangents and stuff, and I, I thought, where do we start with this and how, how would it make best sense to people? And you, you're quite right, you know, the, the, the trigger event. And... I think just picking up on your point there about social media, I look back at this particular uh, Instagram post with the most like rage and like, oh my god, what were you thinking putting this fucking post out? Like, <laughs> so so ba- to put some context to this, we we run a three day coaching education course where we invite twenty coaches from around the world to come on this course, and we'd um, we'd plan to do four. Um, in the first part of this year, so um, uh, we did, we ran one in um, at, at Nike. We were invited by Nike to go to the World HQ in Portland, Oregon. So we flew over there. Um, I arrived on the mid afternoon. We started the three day course the next day. So we had one, two, three, mm. and then the following uh, that evening, we then flew over to Sydney, and we had um, less than a day off in Sydney before we did the next three day course. One, two, three. And then I flew back then from Sydney and landed back in Perth. And within literally six hours of actually landing back in Perth after that massive tour, and they, it's these are high octane sort of sessions, you right. know, and yeah. they take a huge amount of energy and yeah. and enthusiasm to sort of do well and uh, so printed the DNA of swim smooth into people. Yeah, exactly right. You know, it's not just a case of them coming on these three day courses and then that being stopped. We're hoping to then pick people uh, from the three day course who might become one of our certified coaches. Anyway, I landed. And this Instagram post, I landed and I, I, I did a, um, a big squad session, a video analysis session, another squad session, then another video analysis session, and I boasted about it yeah. on Instagram. And check I, me I out. check me out. Look at <laughs> uh, look at this workload. You know, I've done. I've uh, you know, we've been flying for fifty hours around the world. This is all taking place in six days or something like this. We've done these three three courses or two courses, and um, I managed to fit in a few, few fast swims and and do all this sort of stuff. And I was I was really very much blowing my own trumpet because mm. you know through Instagram and Facebook and all that sort of stuff, of which I've now had a huge. I'd like to say 180 degree turn in terms of how I approach those platforms. Yes. Um, I've, I've initially I brought myself back off them, as in I haven't been uh, too prolific on them just recently because I, I started to, I, from this particular instant, I you know I blow my own trumpet, which is what I've always done, which is I think is what a lot of us do as well. You know, we mm. sort of um, there's a balance that we do need to. Yeah, I think I think so, but this was genuinely a an egotistical. Yeah. Um, Instagram post saying, Dick's "Look great. at me, yeah, look <laughs> at me, uh, how how great am I?" type of thing. So the ironic thing with that, that was on the uh, Monday morning, and I had to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. And that that weekend, the Friday was Good Friday, and we were due to um, go off camping with some friends, very close friends down in Bremer Bay. And you know, I got through that week. I worked hard as I usually do. I did a lot of training. Uh, I was really excited about going on this uh, family holiday, and to the point where we got really organised the day before, packed most of the car, and then on the morning that we were due to set off, um, I'd literally brewed the coffee. It was ready in the cup holder. You weren't even taking laptops and phones. No, you? nothing. No. Yeah. So I'd actually, I'd sort of, if there is such a trigger, if I, I, I recognised with this camping trip that I needed to step back a little bit yes. and I was thinking right okay I'm not going to take my phone I'm not going to take a laptop and stuff which I normally do and I'm normally naughty and I look at it when I, I'll go to the toilet for half an hour and I'm you know I'm not doing anything untoward I'm actually just looking at the yes. at the phone checking my emails and, yeah. and trying and responding stuff when I should be on holiday so I thought right we're going to go down ahead of this holiday I'm going to go and, and Michelle was actually quite surprised that I said I was going to do this anyway the car was running the coffee was in there and I was lifting the last bike up onto the the rack and it's my t- my seven year old girl's bike lifting it on there and I just felt this shooting searing pain going right the way down my leg and I fell over and the bike fell on top of me and you know I was screaming the kids were there and they saw well, why is dad crying like this you know and like what's happened and Michelle came running out and 
as you could see that was in a bit of a mess but her being a physio she thought you know don't panic don't panic let's see what it is so she's come back inside let's have a cup of tea everything's all right with the cup of tea <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and and we'll, we'll set off you know we had a we, michelle to a credit sort of thing always wants to have a deadline we need if we say we're going to set off at eight o'clock we've got to be off at eight o'clock and, and yeah. i was thinking this was 758 or something like that and i was yeah. thinking oh my god the deadline's approaching got to, <laughs> got to go, 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 go. so she'd come in and she'd um, don't worry about it we'll set off in half an hour forget the forget what time we've got to get down there <clears> and stuff like that we'll set off in half an hour but i knew instantly that i wasn't going anywhere and not only that day but for the you know for the next 10 days I spent completely in bed with this with this back injury and and it's almost like a, an old friend is this back injury because it's it happened to me six years ago right um, I had uh, spinal surgery for it six years ago right um, at that point I that was a couple of months after I'd done the uh, Manhattan Island swim in 2013 and I came home and life was feeling all quite rosy because I'd done this big race I'd won it I was feeling good about myself and I was thinking right I'm gonna just not have to train as much and just relax into that and then bam I've got this back injury and it and you know I suffered for about seven months with it before I went to get spinal surgery mm. but I was very very depressed when when it got to that point I was, I was literally begging the surgeon please do this for me and, you know and when he fixed it it literally was a fix it was just like I woke up I was, knew the pain was gone I had you know three three four five weeks of uh, rehab but I was soon back to it after mm. that and I didn't really pay it much heed I, I didn't know why I'd hurt myself I didn't know what had gone wrong I, I can't remember lifting anything heavy I can't remember doing anything wrong and really you know just recently with this new one lifting this bike that shouldn't be enough to no. break somebody's back not when they're 40 years of age and stuff no. like that and you know and uh, and relatively healthy and all of that so um so uh, anyway they just um, four months ago it happened again when I like say I'm going down to Bremer Bay and I was laid up there, and I just fell into this absolutely massive hole because I, the, the biggest thing, it was just despair completely. <clears throat> and I think that the major thing initially was just the feeling of guilt because I knew had I, I knew I'd been working really hard up until that point, and I knew I really wanted this holiday. I knew the kids wanted this holiday, and our friends wanted to see us, and I'd started to. Maybe even at that point, I started to recognise this. You've been doing it too hard, and you've been mm. working too hard. I remember, to be honest, with you, I remember being in Sydney for the three day course, and um, and feeling like I just felt very unhealthy. I just felt quite um, like I was burning the candle at both ends. But part of that felt good because part of that felt like I was that's who I am and that's what I'm mm. about. You know, oh, wow, I work really hard and get the kudos from that, and da da da. And I think, to be perfectly honest with you, coming over to Australia. Um, and I don't get me wrong, I love the country and stuff like that, but the whole digger spirit and you've got to work yep. hard to be successful yep. and stuff like that, that's really appealed to me as a you know, mm. as somebody who has that as part of their DNA, if you like, and it's almost over overtaken everything in yes. many ways. And I'm sure it would have happened to me in the UK as well, but I guess I guess what I'm saying is people people do give and receive a lot of respect over mm. here for working and seem to be working very, very hard. Mm. And, you know, so in this particular scenario, you know, the, the back was sore, and then I had this massive guilt that I couldn't take the kids away on holiday. You know, we, it, we were only camping. We hadn't paid a huge amount of money or anything like that. But it was just this feeling of guilt of not being able to sort of follow through on, okay, now Dad's giving us some time, and or now my husband is giving me some time type of thing um, with Michelle there. And she... Um, uh, M Michelle, to her credit, was was brilliant about it, you know, because the I kept saying to them, "Well, you guys go down. We paid for it. The, the, I'll be all right. I'll just stay here. I knew I was going to be flat out on, on the bed, and I still had some of the old drugs from six years ago, right. uh, like the pain, the really strong painkillers, um, like the Endone and the Tramadol and stuff, and and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just take some of these and try to settle it down a little bit, but it was. It was just bad. It was like really, really bad. And um, I, when I guess as, a, as somebody who's self-employed, I'd actually booked out that week anyway to go on holiday. So there wasn't the stress of you've got to go back on the pool deck because Sally was running all my sessions. But the following week, I had to go back to work because hmm. that's what you got to do. You know, you've got to earn your living and you've got to do this and stuff like that. So I, I literally had to, I guess, put on a bit of a brave face and go down to the pool deck. And I remember that first session back, uh, and I'd emailed the squad saying, like, I've had this incident, we didn't go away on holiday. And people were saying to me, just take more, take as much yes. time as you need off, you know. Sally will run that, we're fine with Sally, and Sally's brilliant, and da-da-da-da. 
But in my head, it wasn't that at all. That was not the story I was telling myself. It's like, no, you've got to get back and you've got to earn the money and you've got to you know, mm. do, prom- uh, deliver on what you've promised to people that you'll be back and you'll be coaching and do this. And um, so I went back on the pool date and I was absolutely terrible, like, like really, really bad. And people, everyone could see it in my face. I had no, I didn't want to be there. I, as passionate as you said, it came across on the last one. I wasn't, that wasn't me wasn't on that day. It just wasn't there at all. Because I was in so much pain. I was in like a huge amount of pain. I couldn't mm. bend over. I couldn't bend down. I couldn't do this. And, and more to the point, I knew... I knew it was going to be this way for quite some time unless I would have this magic surgery again, which I wanted, which I craved. I thought, look, I knew it worked last time. I want it again now. But of course, no neurosurgeon in their right mind would immediately, when somebody hurt, you know, somebody hurts their back, yeah. they're not immediately going to put them under the knife. You want to fix it. You want to be out of it. And I did, yeah. I wanted to fix it. I wanted to be out of it, you mm. know. And um, a friend just earlier on today knew I was going to be doing this podcast. And he said, "Make sure you don't over dramatize it, Paul. Make sure you, you know, you you don't. Um, it's only a bad back. It's nothing more than nothing more than that. But, <laughs> but when you're in that scenario, it, it's all about perspective, right? You know, it's about that was my reality at that point in time. These are the things that I was telling myself I have to go and do. The brain goes and, to some pretty dark places. Oh, really? You know, really I've dark, had yeah. I've had injuries while I was playing rugby. I remember once getting right to the peak." of, of um, running through some senior teams when I was quite young. And, you know, I was on the tipping point of, of, of about to be picked for, you know, a first-team men's rugby yeah, at right. a, a young age. And then in training, someone just hooked me over and just just shredded up the X muscle across your back. Right, right. And, and I was like, oh. and um, yeah. And I've had other things, you know, knee problems during marathon training, shoulder problems yeah, during swimming. Yeah. swimming. And you know you you you're right in the middle of everything, and it just takes you to the darkest places. Oh, yeah, yeah. It just finds yeah. the darkest places. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, all this training's down the yeah, pit. Yeah. All this money's down the pit. I can't do this. I'm letting yeah. that down. I'm just, and it really oh, finds totally. the weakest spots. Totally. You know, I, I think it um, it might seem quite trivial to somebody that I've only hurt my back. You know, and this is a a, th- a, you know, a first world problem type of thing, but when when I was there living it and you know still I've still got the pain I'm just dealing with it I guess a little bit better but I um that was the the reality at that point mm. and um and and you, you know if you if you hurt your back and you're in an office job and you don't have to be around anybody it's still bad it's still a bad back but you don't have to entertain and I use that word liberally entertain yeah. because that's what I'm doing on the pool day yeah. I'm motivating people I'm trying to get them to enjoy the session I feel bad if they don't enjoy the session I feel even worse if they don't enjoy the session because I'm in a because I haven't been the best that I can be and stuff yeah. and I, so I um, you know it, it, it felt really bad I thought you know how am I how am I going to get through this and how long is it going to take and in that meantime, what happens with the squad? Do, do people start to do people start to leave the squad? These are the things I'm telling myself in my head. Yeah. Do people start to leave because now long, Paul's mm-hmm. no longer coaching like he used to coach, and you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and and all these sort of things going going around and around your head. But it was, um, yeah, it was just a it was an awful awful period to go through. And the crazy thing was, I, I like I said, I made this list of different issues and things which I've been sort of dealing with um, over the course of dealing with this back pain and different people that I've been speaking to with and the crazy if you believe in and I didn't until all this happened I'm not a everything happens for a reason man the universe has spoken that is not me or right. at least it didn't used, didn't used to, be. to be didn't used to be me but there's certain things that happened around this which have made me sort of you know the same guy who sent me this text saying don't over dramatize it you know, put it into perspective. I have things have caused me to bring things into a bit of perspective. So, mm. one of the biggest slaps in the face really was when we were over in um, uh, Nike. Uh, one of the girls who had actually applied for this particular course over there, she's a 19-time um, Paralympic medalist and has um, seven Paralympic gold medalists. She's right. a, a um, an athlete from Canada, and she came down on the on the course, and she was born missing her right leg. 
including her hip so it's not yeah. there's no there's no sort of quad or anything like that there's yeah. no knee it's the entire whole of her right right side that's missing and and a kidney on that right hand side as well and um her name's stephanie and and the, the funny thing was she came on this course and i knew her to be obviously a, a super athlete like yes. a mega athlete you know if for any of you listening you know swimming and times and stuff this lady with one leg can swim under four minutes 40 for 400 long course freestyle (laughs) which is really really fast right you know she i mean two of her two of her world records still stand to this day like you know she's phenomenal amazing so i was when she applied for the course i was super which was maybe six months prior i was super flattered that she wanted to come on our course being at that caliber of athleticism and we during the three-day course, we end up striking up a a bit of a relationship, a bit of a friendship, and it was it was weird because initially I definitely felt like I was um, trying to um, make her enjoy the session more so than I might have been making other people enjoy the session. Like yes. I wanted to try to prove to her. Yes that what we were doing mm. would work for her athletes going forwards and I wanted to impress her and yeah. you know all this sort of st- all this sort of stuff you know that's the the ego firing up there and on the second day she she challenged me a lot actually during the 3 day course she was saying well I don't I don't see what you mean about this I don't see so then I'm having to explain myself and it was never in a negative way it's just she wanted to genuinely understand no. And know what what we're talking about. Anyway, at the end of the second day, we're walking back from the pool, and I'm all like focused on what I've got to deliver next. And then we've still got the next, the third day, which is the biggest day where all these swimmers come in. And just out of nowhere, she came up to me and she just said, "You're a really deep person, aren't you?" I was like, uh, "No, I'm thinking about freestyle drills." But and she said, "No, no, you're very, you're a very deep person. I want to get to know and understand you a little bit more." And I was like, I was totally like shell shocked. I didn't know what she meant and what she was sort of aiming at and stuff like that. I thought, how can she see that when I'm just up here presenting? I'm not really. I didn't really feel like I was, you know. Um, there's the presenter Paul, and then there's the real Paul, if you like. You mm. know? And and mm. and so she saw this real Paul through all of that, and I didn't. And I couldn't understand how she saw it. And what she initially wanted to know was, how do I manage all of what I do? You know, how do I manage the enthusiasm, the energy and the and the stuff? It's just, how many hours a night do you sleep and how much work do you put in? It's just, how do you keep it doing? And you've been doing it for so long. How, she was just curious about that. So that was a couple of weeks prior to me actually hurting my back. And then ironically enough, when I hurt my back, it was my right leg with mm. this massive searing right, nerve right. pain going yeah. down it. But she's, she's such a lovely, like genuinely lovely, lovely person. I'm so lucky to have actually met her and, and struck up this friendship with her I felt comfortable enough to say to her she said how's your back doing today I'm just on whatsapp and I said well you know it's really quite sore at the moment I haven't got any feeling down my right leg and she goes don't worry join the club <laughs> <laughs> I've never had any feeling down my right leg because obviously she was born She's without it one. you know and, and and that's the sort of so this deepness if you like that she saw in me it came at a brilliant time because she was then able to these conversations got quite deep and and constructive in terms of like you know you do need to keep mm. perspective here this is not the end of the world and this is this and this, this and um and she just she was just one of a list of people i guess who've actually sort of really um helped yeah. me through this uh, through this sort of process yeah so it sounds the way you're talking about it that um the backache wasn't uh, the backache. <laughs> the back injury wasn't just a back injury. No, it's a bloody wake up call. A huge wake up call. But at that point, yeah. I wasn't ready to. At that point, it was just an injury. At that point, it yeah. was me just going, "Bloody hell, I can't go on holiday." Yeah. Bloody hell, I can't. So when do we get switch. past the self pity and start to open? It took up a long to time. The lessons it took a long time. It took a long time. So I. Um, as soon as that happened, I was laid up in bed. The, the biggest fear that went through my head was I mentioned earlier on that we had four of these three-day courses going, and the the other two were going to be in Mallorca in Spain, mm. and they were coming up within. I think they would have. I would have flown out. Yes, I would have flown out to do the three-day courses. I have to go to Prague first to go and do our kids program. Um, 
I would have flown out about three and a half, four weeks after hurting the back. Mm. So at that point, I'm still in a huge amount of pain. I, in total, I've been in hospital six times since that injury happened with getting cortisone injections, epidurals, all these sort of things to try to settle it down without going to the extent of having the surgery. Mm-hmm. But it, I, was in a, I was in a bad way and, um, and I started to panic. I was thinking, well, we've got 40 coaches, so two lots of 20, coming to Mallorca. They've already paid for their flights. They've already paid for the accommodation. They've paid for the course. They want to come on this course. They've organized yeah. whatever they needed to do to come yeah. and come on this course. We can't just suddenly... We've got to deliver. We've got to deliver it. We can't cancel it. If we cancel it, we'd have gone bankrupt. That it's as simple as that. Like yeah. we, the, we, we didn't have enough room. We haven't got enough room and movement to sort of pay for 40 people's international flights and and their accommodation is that like, I'm not sure what business could do that, but yeah. we certainly couldn't do that. Yeah. So I had to get to a point where I could get on this bloody plane. And as it transpired, I, you know, I always fly economy. I had to upgrade and pay for a business class flight. It freaked me out how expensive they actually are. Yeah. But it was the only way of actually guaranteeing that I could get across there. So the first trip, like I say, was to Prague. So we flew over to Prague. So we're going to be in Prague for a week. And we work on this kids program. And the, the, I guess the second person who's helped me through this a little bit is one of our coaches, Gabriella. So Gabriella is a coach. She's been born in Prague. She's had quite a hard upbringing herself over over a lifetime, and she she works furiously hard. She's super passionate. Like she is me at my most passionate times a hundred type of thing. Super hard worker. And when we we've been seeing her every year for the last three years because she's been she came up with the idea of how to actually translate our adult swim smooth program into a kids format and she's done the most unbelievably good job i was sharing it with one of our coaches this morning she was jaw drop gobsmacked it's 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 brilliant yeah last year we were working through it with her and gabby was sick the whole time with her like really mega sick like yeah bad throat and chesty Mm. cough and she just didn't look like a very healthy person and I vividly remember saying 12 months ago to her Gabby you need to slow down a little bit you're working too hard here Mm. yeah 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 that's right and I and I and and, you know and that has obviously come back to bite me as that comment because when we got over to Prague I was I was piked up to the max on some of these horrible drugs like some Lyrica, Endone, Tremadol, um, the whole kit and caboodle, um, Naprosyn I think is the other one and uh, and then all this stuff to counter that so you don't feel nauseous and I was I was yeah. like a walking pharmacy basically yes. and um, I had to take it because I was, there's no other way I'd function but of course a lot of those drugs make you drowsy and make you feel like you can't function properly and um, so the first few days we were there I was just I was just totally uh... come on sorry first few days yeah dog barking the first few days we were there, I was just totally consumed by just feeling like I, I just wanted sleep all the time, and I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't function, I couldn't help out. So again, I had this feeling of like being really quite guilty that I wasn't helping the team. There's three of us there working yeah. on the, on supposedly finalising this project, and I was just totally useless, totally, yeah. totally useless. So we went out one night for some food after working you know, a crazy 15, 16 hour day, and mm. I ordered my food, and I just felt so bad. I said, guys, I. You can you bring it home takeaway? I'm I'm going. So I just walked off by myself, feeling sorry for myself, but just feeling in a lot a lot of pain. Yeah. And that went on the next couple of days, and then I think on the second last day, Gabriella said to us, "Right, we're going to go. We're going to take a day off." And I was like, "Really? She, this is the sort of lady who'd never take a day off, at least not her old self." We're going to take a day off. We're going to go for a walk through the this beautiful countryside in in Prague, oh, in Czech Republic, uh, about an hour and a half outside of Prague, and. And it was awesome, like because we were able to, like you know, just relax, and we weren't talking about work and da da da. And at that meal, that later on that night, she she said to me, Paul, you know how you gave me that advice last year to slow down and back off. Well, I took your advice, but now you need to take that advice. Mm. She says this back problem that you've got right now is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. And of course, I didn't want to hear that at yeah. all because you asked then what was it? When did it suddenly become less of a woe is me type of thing? And I was furious that she'd said that. I said, "How do you know you don't know what this back pain feels like?" I'm fine. And she could see I was there. Like, I, was on, I had all these drugs laying out on the table, ready just to pop them, sort of thing. And just and and she was, but she was absolutely right. She was absolutely yeah. right. She said, "You need to so look at this." Crack? And, 
When what, did you crack to I, that? I, when did they crack open to? To actually being receptive to that. Yeah, well, again, to, it's, it still wasn't... It, like yeah. it, we, we then jumped on the flight to go over to Mallorca. And Mallorca, if you've never heard of Mallorca, yeah. it's in Spain. I know you, Bryn, have, but if your listeners haven't heard of it, it's this beautiful, uh, idyllic island where a lot of people um, in their yeah. teens and 20s sort of thing would go there to yeah. party yeah. and da 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 <laughs> But now we, there's also this massive festival of open water swimming there. And we've been supporting this festival as like guest coaches for the last four years. And it's where we choose to run our three-day coach education courses. So we flew over for that. And, um, and it was... I remember sitting down, uh, recording, going for a swim, actually. It was the first swim that I'd done in four weeks. Mm. I literally wasn't doing anything at all, not even walking or anything. I was, I decided I was going to go for the swim. And it turned out that it didn't actually hurt my back too badly. And I was all quite buoyed up and excited. I said, right, Adam, let's do this podcast. So we did our own podcast talking mm. about oh, injury yeah. and illness and stuff like that. But as it transpires, we've only just put that out about a week mm. ago. Because for the next three months, I went on this massive slippery slope back down again so I was feeling quite buoyed up but then we did this three day our first three day coach education course and I was again propped up on all the drugs and stuff like that but I I did these three 16 hour days and I I thought I was doing a really good job especially not even not even with the injury but I thought I was doing a really good job even with the injury and everything I was taking. Mm. I thought, this is definitely one of the best courses I've ever, ever run. And I feel like I'm really performing well yeah. here. And people were seeing the results and the improvements and stuff like that. But I was also going through this period where I was reflecting on what Gabby had said to me about you need to back off a little bit. And in conjunction with that, some one of my friends said to me, you need to look at this thing called HRV, which is heart rate variability. And a lot of the wearables, you know, the watches, the Garmin's, the yeah. Apple watches and stuff, they measure this thing. But there's a there's a ring called an Aura ring, which, I've, which I'm wearing here. Yeah. And um, it measures your sleep effectiveness and sleep quality. And I knew that I didn't sleep a lot. I sleep four or five hours a night. But when I go to bed, I'm like asleep a mi- instantly. Second, yeah. Like, you know, and then I wake up when the, when the alarm goes sort of thing. So... I would say for the time that I do spend sleeping, it's reasonably, I thought it was reasonably good quality. But I started to somebody, the guy who told me to get this ring, said, you've got to listen to this podcast with this guy, Peter Atier, and this um, and this um, guy, an expert on sleep called Matthew Walker. Yeah. And the whole thing that they talk about is this idea that, you know, there's a reason why people say you need seven or to eight hours of, of sleep a night, and mm. this is why. And they started to break it down very medically. And the thing that sort of struck me straight away was the, the link between lack of sleep or sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's. Yeah. Now, my granddad died with Alzheimer's disease, right. and I saw the deterioration. It was absolutely horrific, and it's something which I've which I'm fearful myself of. So as soon as they started saying, look, sleep deprivation has been linked with Alzheimer's, suddenly my ears pricked up. And then what really got me was he said how, you know, I remember as a kid, he's about the same age as me, this guy, Matthew Walker. I remember as a kid, I was in, I was born in UK, which is obviously where I'm from as well. And the Prime Minister at the time was Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher used to talk about how she could run the entire country four hours, on four hours a night's yeah, sleep. For 10 and years. So, and for 10 years. And so did Ronald Reagan. And so did Winston Churchill. All of whom ended up with some form of dementia or Alzheimer's or what have you. So mm-hmm. he was making that connection. And I was thinking... Oh my God, I remember, so when people of the past have been telling me, you're not sleeping enough, you need to sleep more, I've always just tossed it away thinking, well, Margaret Thatcher managed to do it. Yeah, yeah. And these guys who, you know, do you know, yeah, what do they know? What yeah. do they know? Especially even my wife, isn't it? What do you know? What do you, what do you know about this? So when he started saying that, it suddenly got it got me, and I was like, "Oh, I'm going to listen to the rest of this." And it was like a six-hour podcast series about sleep and why we sleep, right. and talking about the benefits of deep sleep, of REM sleep, and all these sort of things. And to keep it fairly brief, because it's well worth listening into that some of the stuff. But from what I've learned from that, mm. when you sleep, let's say you sleep from um, let's say it's from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. so eight hours. The first half of that time that you're asleep, so from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m., the majority, so 2 a.m., sorry, the majority of your deep sleep will occur. It's sort of biased towards that first yes. half. In the second half, it's biased more towards your REM sleep. Mm. Now, things like uh, alcohol and drugs can really affect the deep sleep. So you feel like you fall, oftentimes if you got drunk, you fall asleep and you think, wow, that's a great way to knock me out. But it's really terrible because it actually erodes into your deep sleep. You're not actually that 
you, you might feel like you're completely comatose, but you're yeah. not really. And it's the deep sleep where we get the uh, rejuvenation of body and physical, your physical self, etc. But the REM sleep where you're actually um, dreaming primarily is where a lot of the mental cognition stuff and the repair for your head and just for mm. mental health is occurring and that tends to occur in the second half as like this is what i've got from the research basically in the second half of the night so my typical work schedule would be i'd get up at four o'clock i'd coach on the pool deck all the way up until about 1 p.m i'd come home i'd do, maybe do a training session myself i'd go and pick the kids up at school at 3 p.m i'd then keep them entertained whilst being naughty and looking at my phone and checking emails and those sort of th- sort of things um, I'd feed uh, whilst M- Michelle was at uh, doing her physio, um, doing physio work. I'd uh, feed them. I'd put them to bed at seven pm. I'd then usually do another little bit of exercise, whether it be on an indoor bike or this little treadmill or something like that. But then at that time, it's about midday in the UK, which is where my business partner is based. And at that point, around about eight pm, I'd be jumping online and actually working from eight pm till about one or two am in the morning, and then waking up again. Oh. and get up at four o'clock yes. and i've been doing this for 15 years right now not every night like yes. that not every i wouldn't say i've averaged two like in that example yeah. two hours a night of sleep but the average over the last 15 years would be at best four four and a half hours a night over the last mm. 15 years and the podcast started talking about this idea that you know if you have this lack of sleep your body doesn't recover it doesn't regenerate and I started putting two and two together, thinking, I'm always getting injured. I've always been getting injured. I feel like I look after myself well or reasonably well and stuff like that. Why do I keep... In terms of nutrition and yeah, exercise. Yeah, nutrition and exercise, you know. And you've even said to yourself, you said to me <clears throat> yourself, you know, you found this this body movement classes that you can do to actually sort of get yourself a little bit more functionally strong in... in, yeah. in um, on axes that you don't normally use for the classic swimming, cycling, and running, all, all these sort of things. And I thought, you know, that's that's good. I'd like to actually experience that. But when you were saying that to me, I was still yeah. in a state where I couldn't really even move yeah. at all. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. You know, and um, and uh, and was advised, you know, you have to let it settle down a little bit first. But anyway, the yeah. the um, with the with the with this research telling me all of this stuff, I started to put two and two together. I was like. Maybe these people have been telling me these things have got a, a point. They yeah. couldn't explain it to me scientifically like this podcast was doing and with data and I'm such a data geek sort of thing. And yeah. So then so I started looking language. That was my language. So then I started to look at the what this ring was telling me and it's telling me that I was, the the uh, apparently the average amount of REM sleep that an adult my age should be getting is around about an hour and a half a night. And um you know, deep sleep would be around about the same as well. My daughter, who wears, a, she's only seven years of age, kids get a lot more sleep than yes. adults do. You know, I'm totally jealous. She gets like four and a half, five hours of deep sleep a night. And I'm like, yeah. what? You know, so anyway, the ring was telling me that I was getting minutes, not hours yes. and a half. I was getting like 12 or 15 minutes maximum of REM sleep and very little deep sleep as well. So I might have felt like I was falling asleep instantly. And the ring tells you that as well. So the average amount of time it should take you to fall asleep is between 10 and 15 minutes. My latency, as they call it, was anywhere between zero and one minute every single night meaning that obviously when i'm getting that i was so totally exhausted that i'd fall asleep instantly not into this healthy type of sleep that was regenerative and stuff but um but the big thing for me and this is this is recognition of like mental health i guess is that when people see me on the pool deck coaching i i I believe i'm perceived as being quite sort of cheerful happy motivating energetic passionate and all these sort of things but the real me inside of all of that, when I come home and I'm actually, you know, I've given all that energy to that group of people, you know, that's my job, that's what I've got to do. But I come home and my headspace is a very different type of place. I'm not that, and I've, you know, I've been seeing a psychologist, um, Peter, for the last six years. And the whole reason I went to see him initially was this whole idea that I, I feel like I should be happy. I feel like I've got a lot of good things going for me, but I just don't feel the sense of happiness. Why is that? We've been starting to unpack it. And a lot of it, now that I've actually drawn these data points together, a lot of it's due to the fact that I just don't get anywhere near enough sleep and specifically enough REM sleep, which would actually help with that. So some of the classic things that somebody would suffer from lack of REM sleep specifically are depression, anxiety, and, 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 you know, the, the feeling of um, just becoming very snappy and very irritable. Yeah. You know, on the pool deck, I don't, I'm super calm because I'm doing a job. Yeah. But when I come home, 
where I should actually be giving my best. Yeah. Really. You should be performing. I should be performing at home better than what I'm performing on a day to day. You know, I'm, I'm not. I'm been the, I've been this for years. Been this snappy, irritable, grump horrible bag. <laughs> grump bag. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. And that's you know that's ultimately over the years that's affected my relationship, not just with my wife, but with my with my kids as well. So I started looking at this and thinking, well, you know, this this got to be something in this. And this HRV aspect of it, heart rate variability, it looks at um, when you go to sleep and when you recover. You start off and. As you, the more you recover, the greater this variability of your heart rate becomes. Yes. Now, the norm is supposedly somewhere between 80 and 120 milliseconds. That's considered a normal amount where somebody's re- well rested and well recovered. Now, if you're training for an Ironman or a marathon swim or something like that, you appreciate that you're doing all this work and you yeah. are going to be tired. Yeah. And that, that number would be suppressed. Typically, it might be in the range of, I don't know, 50 to 80 or something like that. But before I listened to this research... I had actually gone out and bought my business partner one of these Aura Rings as well. So when we're on this three-day course in Nike, at Nike and then also in Sydney, we're sleeping in the same room at the same amount of time, having the same amount right. of sleep, and we had a sleep competition. Yeah. Oh, what day did you get? What was the app showing for you? And that you, we're getting the same amount of length of sleep at that at that yeah. time. But the heart rate variability was so interesting because mine is typically about 10 to 15. Right, super long. And it should be 80 to 120. Yeah. And his is 110 to 120. And this is a guy who's had chronic fatigue and stuff, yeah, who's yeah. had issues himself. And it was so much higher. And it was so much higher that I contacted my mate, Dan Plews, over in New Zealand, who's one of the leading author- world's leading authorities on HRV. I said, I think Adam's ring's broken. It's not like, <laughs> it's measuring really high. Like, I just assumed that that's what it was. And he said, he came back to me and said, it's not his ring that's broken, it's your body that's broken. He said, <laughs> yeah, he said, you, you are, you're not recovering from day-to-day stuff. And he says, your body is almost like behaving like mm. you're doing a, an Ironman every single day. And I thought, well, something's got to... Something's got to change. So, mm. just going back to this three day this three day course in Mallorca. If you haven't lost us no, <laughs> listening to this, but the on original this, question was what cracked you? Yeah, up? well, this is it. I mean, so this, so this, this, that piece of uh, that podcast that I listened to, or that series of podcasts that I listened to, listening to that research, double crossing it with this data that was coming fr- across from this, I'm starting to think there's obviously merit in this, and maybe this workload that I've got just isn't healthy. I've been thinking I'm Superman. A lot of people have been telling me I'm Superman. But a lot of this data is now starting to make me very worried and scared because of Alzheimer's, of mental health issues, which I know I've suffered from for many, many years and not really understood why. And I'm thinking, well, you know, there's many things which might cause mental health issues. But if for me, if I, if most of the other aspects in my life are fairly normalised, you know, look after myself, sleep well, eat well, exercise well... And yet, I'm still having these issues of anxiety and depression. You know, what could be potentially to blame for that? And yeah. it sat, this was like sticking out like a beacon, going like, yeah. "Okay, you need to listen to this sleep." So anyway, on the on the first day of this course, I had started to open up with some of the candidates, talking about how I've made this. Uh, hey, I've got this ring. You know, it's telling me this, and and uh, they all knew I had a back injury because I emailed them beforehand, and yeah. uh, they knew I was taking drugs. And I said, look, I'm still. I wouldn't run this unless I felt I could perform at 100, percent and I'm doing it. And da da da. So I started opening up and sharing this this story with um, with a few of them. One particular coach on the course, um, I sat down with him for lunch and uh, started to share this discussion. And he said, you've got to really watch that. You've got to, you know, because he said, I've, I've got this friend in the UK who died when he was 46. He had a massive heart attack on the on the bike. I said, oh, that, that's funny, because I've got a friend in the UK who was 46 and had a massive heart attack on the bike. Same. It's the same guy. Yeah. It's the same guy. So I then started opening up and sharing a lot of what I've been going through with this particular coach. And he's maybe 10, 12 years older than me. Um, and you know, a lot of the stuff which people have been pointing to me and me sort of coming out, if you like, in terms of just acknowledging how I've been this alcohol, uh, alcoholic, yeah. workaholic, yeah. I should say. Sorry. All is not good. All is not good, exactly right. And I'm starting to come out about this and I'm starting to be a little bit vulnerable with people, which normally I wouldn't do. Normally I'd have yeah. this fence up and I'd be like, yes, I am Superman and yes, I, yeah. I can live like this. Anyway, I, uh, I started opening up like that. I started getting questions on the course from people sort of saying, well, you know, if you didn't have that lifestyle that you've been living for 15 years, do you think we would all be sat here now listening to you? Have you? Would you have been able to grow 
what you've grown to the level that you've managed to grow it to yeah. if if you haven't done all of that and it was a really interesting question and one which I'm not sure I can really answer because mm. you'll never know or I'll never know right I'll never know if I, if yeah. I, I suspect probably not no. but uh, has it come at the cost of potentially serious long term health and that that was my big worry so um, we got to the end of day two and we're very close to, to finishing off um, the, 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 the course and I was feeling knackered. I knew I had to get uh, get finished and get some food and then go to bed and be ready for for day three. And the one course, sorry, the one coach I'd actually shared um, this vulnerability with this the whole thing of you know, I think it's to do with this, and I think I can see that in myself, and it's affecting relationships and friendships and stuff like this. To this day, I don't know why he did it, but you talk about the breaking point, and the breaking point was this: in front of everybody after two days of me coaching them and, and mentoring them, mm. he just stood up and said, this is all bullshit. Swim smooth is all bullshit. You can't prove any of it. None of it's scientific enough. Y- your swim types model is um, a, a, a load of pseudoscience, he called it. You can't prove anything. And and I was like, I was absolutely flabbergasted. And we're at that point in the course where we're about to meet the swimmers on the third day who I was about to pair all the coaches up with. And we had the profiles of these swimmers for the third day. Yeah. You know, John from Manchester, who's a engineer who thinks he's held back because he's been on this plateau with his speed. And yeah. So we start to associate that information with what we're likely to see the next day. So we can not be totally blinded by that, but to preempt Take how we might points. take some data points, yeah, points. yeah, like like sort of thing. Okay, well, this is where we're going to start, and it, and if we know a starting point, it can speed up and improve the efficiency of the way we all coach. In front of everyone, he says, "You now, now you're using Barnum statements to suggest that, uh, and you're, and you're, you're convincing all the coaches around here that they." That what you're saying is just gospel, and that they're, and they and and they and they've got to listen to you, and you know, yeah. So this was in front of everybody, in front of people that I've who've come to respect me over the years, yeah. people who've spent two days with me listening to what I've done and see me working with them and stuff like that. For him to then say this, and of course, I didn't know, I didn't know what to say because I I was like, like the old me, as in a few years ago, would have snapped immediately, and I'd have fought back, and I'd like. But I thought I can't do that. Like I'm in this professional scenario, I can't do that. Yeah. So I'm almost like looking around the room for is anyone going to help me out here and stuff. Yeah. And the other coaches did start helping me out in terms of they were saying, well, I can. See, Paul's not saying this is all black and white, and you must talk. He's but he's given us a framework for with each within which to work. Mm. And um, one of the one of the coaches who we invited on the course, she if this this guy um, claimed that he was super scientific. And one of the ladies we brought on the course, she was into hypnotherapy um, during coaching and stuff like that. Mm. And like use a, a more of a, you know, in her own words, she, she would say, I am using pseudoscience, you know, to work with the, with the athletes. Anyway, she, she was very strong with the belief that she was supporting us and stuff. And, and she said to this guy, she said, um, oh, I, think, I think your energy fields are out. And you to to this coach, think your energy feel. Come over here, let me give you a hug, and it'll all be all right and stuff. And of course, that was just like fuel on the fire sort of thing. And it was, yeah. and the whole thing was just it was very nasty for about an hour and a half. Yeah. And it shouldn't have been. It shouldn't have been because I've been very careful, and I'm always very very careful. We've run we've run thirty yeah. odd of these courses over the years, just saying. You know, swim smooth is not black and white. It is fifty shades. We call it fifty shades of smooth. You know, yeah. for the sense that you know the way I deal with you would be different to the way I deal with your partner Lucy would be, just because we're, we've got different personalities, we've got different swimming styles, all these sort of stuff. And, and it's suddenly, in my most vulnerable moment, with this horrible back pain, and having been specifically vulnerable with this guy yeah. who I trusted, he laid everything. He, he laid everything out, and he just and he just he smacked it for six right in front of everyone, and I was. I was I was just I was blown away and I didn't know I didn't know what to do and of course I I tried to show I tried to say look this is why I'm suggesting this and can't you see it works anyway we I had to stop it and when he they all went off to dinner and I was just sat there fuming like properly properly fuming and I was I was in pain I was fuming I was sad I was upset I was angry more anger was the, probably the biggest thing and um, one of our other coaches said to me, he said, 
two of the other coaches didn't really like the way you handled that and what you and what you said in response. You know, it was, all, it was me sort of saying, "Well, this is why we do this," and can't you see? And don't you understand? And da da da. And when I heard that response, I knew this guy had some beef with with what I, with what we do. Um, he's quite a senior coach as well. But to hear if that other two coaches weren't very happy with how I handled the situation. It was like a nightmare, like it was an absolute nightmare. So Adam, my business partner, took me aside and said, look, you just got to pull yourself together. We've got to get through day three tomorrow. And then you can have a bit of a rest and stuff. And um, so anyway, day three came and I just, I, I tried to blank it out in my head. This guy, this coach who had said all these things did come back on the first third day. And I was, um, yeah, I, I, was, I was grateful that he did come back. So I thought he, he might well just not come back and it would create this horrible, yeah. awkward feeling amongst everybody. Unresolved. Unresolved feeling, you know. But he did come back and he sat in and he did all the stuff that everyone was meant to do. And ironically enough, I'd actually, and I didn't mean to do this, it was just totally at random, I'd actually paired him up with somebody who fit who fits our very much our classic overglider um, swim type. So yeah. of our six swim types, it's overglider. Someone very analytically minded, wants to make the stroke absolutely perfect and smooth things out. And for the coaches who are quite experienced, they all know, they could all see what other which other training program and methodology he'd been using to swim the way he was swimming. And I was able to relate to this guy like, like that, I was able to get straight to the point and sort of say, this is what needs to do, and do it in a way which he, where he felt empowered by that. And this guy made a massive amount of improvement during the day. And this coach came up to me at the end, the one who bagged me the day before, and said, I couldn't believe how quickly and easily you were able to sort out his faults and give us direction. And I, all I wanted to say to him was, well, but that's what yeah. I was, that's what being yeah that's yeah. The, the the source of your argument yesterday was what you've just witnessed here in and this I didn't say that though I just I just I just sort of acknowledged I said okay thanks yeah yeah and I didn't want it to blow up again because I was still feeling really upset by it yeah so in some ways it felt like he was saying to me you were right I can see it so I went away that third day thinking okay well I feel a bit more okay with this I'm still in a lot of pain blah, blah, blah. next day massive long email like sheets and sheets and paper telling us everything that is wrong with swim smooth and and how we've got this um uh duty to the world of swimming to make sure that everything we pass can be scientifically proven and put out there before we actually publish right. anything right. so you know without sort of sounding too nasty or what have you this is a guy who has a very small following himself has very few athletes and is probably held back by the procrastination of not wanting to mm. do anything to help anybody before he can actually improve it himself mm. and that's that's fine like you know i can if that's but i don't want to do that i want to help as many people yeah. and my when you talked about that passion beforehand it is yeah. I, I i i believe that i've been very fortunate in my life to actually be here in Perth, in a massive swimming community, and have access to thousands of swimmers, and have coached thousands and thousands of swimmers over the years. So all I've been able to do is sort of come up with some sort of system, yeah. which well, makes it easier. Based observation on, based, based on, based on, on er, empirical research, based yeah. on based on observation. Exactly right. And all I want to do is share that with people, and I want other coaches to, if I can mm. streamline and smooth their processes, that's how I'll do it. Yeah. Anyway, got the email. And I, I hit absolute rock bottom, like really bad. Adam flew back to the UK. He had to go back to the UK. And I was left by myself uh, in Mallorca. And I had these voluntary coaching position, coaching sessions that I said I would run mm -hmm. by myself. I was lifting all this big heavy gear because there was no one else there to help me. And I was in a terrible mess. I was drugged up to the eyeballs. My mum was there. My mum and my stepdad, Steve, were there with me. But I was useless. I couldn't do anything. We had one day in Palmer, but they could see that I was in a in a very very bad way like really yeah. really bad way and I, I remember waking up at three o'clock on um about three days after the course three o'clock in the morning couldn't get back to sleep so i was in so much pain popped some more drugs and ended up walking the streets of uh of mallorca in this in this haze and i was very black all my all my thoughts and everything were super depressed it was a feeling of it was it was this what feeling sort of what sort of things what were you telling yourself i was i <laughs> First and foremost, I was feeling suicidal, and really? that might sound like quite a strong statement to start with. But the ultimate this that is was it. it. This is enough. it. This is it. I've had enough. And I, I think what what was what led me to dramatize, if you want to use the word from my from a friend saying, "Don't dramatize; it's only bad back." Um, 
the reason I think I got to that particular state was the fact that I had started to connect those dots about what has potentially been causing this back problem over the years. It's the hard working, it's the lack of sleep, it's the mm. um, it's the shunting of other stuff in my life, like family and friends and stuff, which I probably, which I now know and regretful and remorseful that I, ha- I have done that to do to do these things only to be told by somebody who's of a very high senior thing that everything you've done is a load of bullshit. Now, he's only one person, yeah. and I can see that, and I know that. Now. Now. <laughs> and even then, I knew it then as well. It's only one person, you know, and the other people who like giving this feedback, this is great, and all these swimmers went away feeling like you've, you've really helped them and stuff like that. Mm. But I think it's a combination of that pain... And making those rec- mm. almost recognizing the the sacrifices that I that I have put on myself and made and done mm. myself to get to, to to get to that point where I could actually be speaking to those people, only for then it to be put into question about you know how solid is this, and I and, and I just and, and it I, undoubtedly the people the doctors and people that I've spoken to since and, and my psychologist Peter as well. I've said, look, don't underestimate the play that the drugs would have had on you, the specifically the types of drugs that you're taking. Yeah. I mean, they all come with things saying this might oh, cause yeah. depression and this might cause anxiety and stuff like that. So I was feeling all of these things. <clears> and, you know, I was up on a um, the hotel that I was staying at, mm. six stories, and I was stood on the balcony. I was just, and I, I was, I was close. I was feeling, <laughs> feeling very bad, very, very bad indeed. And um, so the drugs do have side effects yes but the drugs are not responsible for the drive no the work you the work used ethic. the word work ethic work workaholic workaholic yeah yeah um the drive the push you know um you sit in your business obviously yep. it's turned up in your sport yeah you know you're very yeah, successful totally. yeah, you're, yeah. Ter- you're very successful at swimming and then you became successful in triathlon you know getting up there in terms of national championships and stuff like that. You know, you live and work in a very goal-driven environment. Um, So, yeah, there's all the drugs and this, that, and the other. That's the trigger point. Yeah, yeah. But there's there's a drive. Oh, yeah, there's a drive, yeah. There's the, you know, when passion turns sour. Mm, That's right, that's right. What's the driving story, Paul? So what has driven me on over the the years? I I think... From the conversations, I've been seeing my psychologist frequently, like twice a week for the last, or um, well, since I got back from mm. early June, so whatever that is, two and a half months or something. And um, a lot of it boils down to simply wanting to, I'm a pleaser. Yeah. I want to please and I want to impress people. I, I can feel it day to day in the pool. If somebody has a bad session yeah. or doesn't like the session or has an argument with somebody else in the session, I feel that, and I, yeah. I'm like, I, I want everyone to have this good session. Mm. I want everyone. You to said it before, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I want everyone to come. I want everyone to have a good time. That's and it. Learn stuff and get faster. That's and... it. So part of it has been this this wanting to to please, but you know that I mean, my 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 dad um, is hugely successful as well as a as a he was a graphic or was a graphic designer. He's now retired, and he did very very well for himself and. I'd be lying if I didn't say that I wanted to try and impress him above and above and beyond anybody yeah. else. You know, and totally I, natural thing to do. Yeah, no, I, and I didn't realise how natural to be to be perfectly honest and until I've started to open up with some of my friends, close friends, about some of these things that I've been feeling. I've got a friend over in over in Melbourne, and his dad was a ex professional cyclist, a very very high caliber, and um, and he became a very good cyclist, also on the professional circuit sort of thing. But he was always being shadowed and compared to his dad. And I I just assumed that these two guys, dad and son, were they you know, they're both brilliant cyclists and stuff. I never thought too much of it other than that. Mm. But it wasn't until he sort of mentioned to me that, you know, well, you're feeling like you've got to impress your dad, but I had to felt like I had to impress my dad as well. And I didn't mm. realise how natural and common of a thing that mm. actually is and and I think you know part of me was wanting to sort of demonstrate that I can be successful and the the, the thing is and this has been brought home to me very very um, prominently just recently is you know what is success what are mm. 
you're actually happy with, you know. To, to me, initially, I, I, I said, so one of my very, very close friends and uh, a mentor, Shelley Taylor-Smith, brilliant swimmer, mm. seven times world marathon swimming champion, I went on her business course, um, Business for Champions, I think it was called, Champion Mindset, um, in 2004, just as I was setting up Swim Smooth, and the, the, the document it's actually right behind you there, the little, the little thing, um, said, what do you want to achieve in life or in your business and what do you yeah. want to do? And I said, I've got this idea that I want to be able to try and reach and help as many people as I can improve their, their swimming. And I think as a young 25 or 26-year-old, whatever it was back then, um, I would have been feeling this feeling of I want to take over the world. I want to, I want to, I want Swim Smooth to be the, you know, the the resource that everybody goes to. And and certainly over the over the years, I was just having a chat with one of our coaches earlier on this morning about the idea that swimming coaching is a very ego driven arena. Hmm. And I think the primary reason so for let me put some context to that yeah i said i said to her that one of our coaches who i mentioned earlier on gabby actually in prague she's been approached by their national swimming federation because they like what we're doing with swim smooth and they can see that it's starting to gain a bit of traction mm. they want to incorporate it within their curriculum but they wanted to prove how successful it is and how successful she's been as a coach and she says, well, I've coached this swimmer, this swimmer, this swimmer. And they say, no, you haven't. They swim with such and such and such a club. And she says, yeah, but those clubs, those swimmers come to me from those clubs for me to coach them and refine their form and technique. And they go back to the clubs. And smash out the case. And smash out the case. But the clubs don't recognise Gabriella in that formula because sometimes they don't even know that Did they're she... coming to see it because... Yeah. They'll often get offended if they're actually receiving outside assistance. And then, honestly, then bring the number of swimmers who come to me here in Perth, mm. young kids, junior swimmers who want some help because they don't feel like they're getting it in their club. Yep. But they say you must not breathe a word of this to yeah. the, to the club. And I've I've got to feel some sympathy for the club and for the coaches because I know that when I'm coaching forty or fifty people, it's totally impractical yeah. to offer meaningful stroke technique advice no. so and that's not kind of what you're there for in a squad session no it's not it's not but the i guess the the parent who wants their kid to do well often thinks that oh little johnny hasn't had any technique advice at all yeah. in the last 12 months therefore we need to seek somebody else yeah so they'll come to me and i'll spend this one and a half hour session with them i'll fix up the track and they'll think it's absolutely amazing and wonderful yeah. but it's almost fueling that yeah bit of it's like, oh, this guy is great because he spent that time with little mm. John. Well, the club coach might well have spent an hour with little Johnny if they'd asked him and paid for that particular service. It's just one of the yeah, services yeah. that I that yeah. I actually offer. But as it stands, you know, there is often a lot of animosity towards that because of the, you know, oh, why do you need to go and see so and so? I'm the I'm the coach for you type of thing. Mm. And you know, in tr- in what we've been trying to do with Swim Smooth over the years to try to almost change the world view on many things. For example, the specific classic example I always use is that there's a there's a misfound belief that to be most efficient in the water, and I probably talked about it this on the first podcast, is to swim down the pool in as few strokes as you possibly can. Yep. So reducing your stroke counts, yep. as we call it, sort of thing. But there's two sides to the equation. It's all very well having a very long stroke, but if that long stroke becomes overly slow in terms of its rate because you're gliding too long between strokes, yeah, you're still slow. you're swimming slow and you're still not swimming any more efficiently. In, yeah. some, in some cases, you end up swimming less efficiently yeah. because you're kicking harder to actually compensate for the dead spot that you got yeah. at the front of the stroke. Look, somebody who lives with, with, with a swimmer whose arms go like, Freaking windmill in a hurricane. Absolutely, yeah, I yeah. Know. That's right. But yeah. if you think, if and you, even the if same you, thing. and even if you think about about when she came to swim with us, she was disgruntled to some extent because previous coaches have said you're no good because your stroke yeah, isn't yeah, long yeah. enough. It's not smooth enough. And yeah. whereas we actually recognise the way she particularly swims because it's, br- I love the way she swims because of the rhythm and the fluidity yeah. and the momentum yeah. that she has within her stroke. And I see so many swimmers like that yeah. all the time. So and I guess five and a half hour crossing. Yeah, I know. Speaks for itself. It does. It does. Well, you'd think it speaks for yourself. Well, incidentally, but, yeah, quicker than anyone else in that previous squad. <laughs> exactly, and and you'd think it speaks for yourself, but there's, there'll still be that fraternity. Yeah. Would then say to yeah imagine how much quicker she could have been if she'd swum oh, with a better you, stroke you know you're actually right Paul and um, yeah and I've heard it yeah and I hear it all the time I yeah. hear that all the time so I guess 
the point I was trying to bring up there about the whole ego thing is that in many ways, what we've been trying to do in terms of changing that world view, mm. there has to be some conviction and belief behind what we do to actually try to challenge mm. that world view. Otherwise, mm. we just stick with the status quo and nothing ever changes. And there are countless examples over, well, over the last 20 years of swimmers doing it differently. Janet Evans being the prime example. Yep. Somebody doing it differently who makes it work for them. Yes. And rather than actually just thinking of them as an anomaly, we actually want to embrace and support that and recognise that mm. that was the right thing for her to have done. Bud McAllister, yeah. who now coaches here in Perth, was Janet Evans' coach. He did the right thing by her by not trying to make her... Mm. Different, hmm. so you can hear that. Usain Bolt wasn't exactly the tidiest looking runner. No, that's right. <laughs> but he's not in effect. No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And so there's a, there's this debate about efficiency and effectiveness, you know, and and I think the, the the point that I keep sort of wanting to hit on here is the fact that you can hear, probably hear in my voice now. I'm getting piped up. I'm getting enthusiastic. I'm getting passionate. Whatever you want to call it about yeah. this particular point, you have to have some of that to get those points across. Yeah, a bit of poke. Bit a of... bit of poke, exactly right. But some of that, of course, is me also wanting to prove yeah. everybody else wrong. Yeah. Or at least not wrong, but make sure that my that your voice is my heard. voice is heard exactly right. And it's at least listened to sort of thing. And, and it's, sort of, it's got a space at the table. It's got a space at the table, exactly right. Because mm, this is your life's work. It is, it is, you know. And you know, you said where where does that drive come from? So that drive comes from having role models in my life like my dad who's worked very hard to get mm. to where he got to and wanting to sort of, you know, um <clears throat> emulate and prove to him and show him that that I you know, I'm a worthy son or whatever you want to call yep. it sort of thing, you know. But that going into the space that I went into, which isn't your classic conventional you know, I was at school. I, I was very good at maths and very good at geography, and, and geology was my favourite thing. And you know, yeah. ironically enough, coming over to Perth when I did do at the time of the, the mining boom and stuff like that, had I gone into geology, I would have been the perfect candidate every year. Yeah, but I probably wouldn't have come to Perth. Yeah, I came to Perth and settled in Perth because of the swimming. Exactly. So I chose to follow a different pathway, and I guess because that pathway, even to this day, people in the squad. You see how much coaching I do. They still say to me, "So it's seven thirty. What do you do the rest of your day? What's, what's your real job, mate?" <laughs> yeah. And I will say, "This is my real job. This what are you talking it. about? This is it. This is me. This is what I. This is what I do." Yeah, 100%. yeah you know. And um, so there's always been that driving feeling for me of thinking I want to show the world. I want to mm. show friends and people that you know it is possible <clears throat> to be um, successful if you like in something that personally motivates and drives you and that you are passionate about. And, you know, a lot of people a lot of people who are stuck in jobs that they don't like often want to aspire to finding the job or the career that, that most moves them and motivates them. But I guess I guess if there is any sort of warning sign from any of this, mm. it's just that idea that, you know, you, you still then got to be careful because there is nobody setting your parameters for you whatsoever. You are setting your parameters, mm. and I have had no parameters. None. Yeah. I can stay up until two a.m. and get up at four a.m., knowing that I feel like I've achieved something by yeah. doing whatever I was doing yeah. that last night. And then I've got to be down on the pool deck, and that then drives the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And then suddenly, mm. you are working sixteen, seventeen hours a day, fifteen years of your life. But then, you know, I've hit, I've hit this this point in my life mm. where I've just, I've hit this brick wall literally, and it's forced me to stop. Gabriella says it's going to be the best thing that ever happens to you, and well, I was it thinking it will, and I'm starting to recognise that now. Yeah. At the time, I didn't want to hear it at all. Of course, you didn't. No, but it's so. It strikes me listening to you that, um, and I've seen this obviously listening to many people on the podcast. It strikes me that there's been almost like a story or a program or part of the operating system, which has been drive, drive, drive. Whether it's seek, seek, you know, started off at a younger age, seek dad's approval, da 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 da, and you know, let's pay homage to it. It's got you to where you've got to. You know, you said earlier on, do you think if it wasn't for the drive, etc., we wouldn't all be sitting in Mallorca and mm. da, 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 da. And I think it's, for me personally, sometimes it, that's probably not the coolest question. The coolest question for me is, is it strikes me that you've had, let's just say you've run this program in yep. your operating system, right? Yeah. And now it's come to an end. It's served its purpose. Yeah. It, it, it probably... It probably protected and propelled you at one point, 
but now it's come to the end of its life. Yep. Um, how does that sit? How does it sit with me? Yeah. Very, it stirred up a lot of very different emotions, like mm. a lot. And I think what somebody who I um, respect highly who swims in my squad and has almost become in, in himself a bit of a father figure to me. Yeah. Um, in the sense that he's always got my back and he's a very successful lawyer himself. And um, when we had a few... I think I mentioned this on the, the first podcast with yourself, the whole Speedo thing, the issue that we had with there, and me thinking yeah. the world is falling apart because somebody's and copying our idea stuff. and nicking our stuff and stuff. And in reality, you know, as a lawyer, he was the first person to say to me, hey, mate, that's life. You know, competition is life. That's what yeah. you've got to accept it and just don't let it destroy you. Keep moving forward and yeah. stuff. And it wasn't the response I expected from him at that time. And when I got back from Mallorca from that horrible period, um, and it was really really horrible i i got back and he one morning after a saturday morning swim session he came up to me and said mate you look absolutely terrible you've got to sort this out otherwise something's going to stop you and you know or are you just going to you know, you're fall hmm. apart or whatever he could see he could see through me but more importantly he felt bold enough i guess to, to actually say that to me whereas everyone else would be like you know how's your back sort of thing and and they're meaning well sort of thing but he, he felt like he had the the, the the key yeah. to unlock the door to actually yeah. yeah so he so he's well, he's drive to intervene the drive to intervene because he could he could see that I was just falling to pieces you know and um, and he said um, you've been for the last fifteen years your measure of success is to make sure that you're going up and 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 up yeah so whether that means more coaches better turnover uh, more followers on Instagram mm. Facebook it's all been about up and he says, but where does that end? You know, when are you going to be happy with a with a point? And prior to all this happening, the answer would be, well, well, the re- actual reality was I'd never be happy because when you get to sixty thousand followers, you want a hundred thousand followers. You want, and then you want two hundred thousand followers and stuff like that. Yeah. So you never get. You know, people say this, and people you hear this, and and oh, you, you know, money doesn't make you happy, or um, you know, success in terms of how many followers you get doesn't necessarily make you happy. You hear of all these very successful influencers and stuff who are who are chronically depressed, and some of them take their own lives and stuff mm. like that. It's very sadly, you know, because a lot of it just feels like anyway. So he said you've been going up and up and up. And he said, what about if you plateau off? What about if you could take some time off? The squad's not going to fall apart. Sally will run the squad for you. Take some time off. And he said, even if it means you come down in terms of your earnings by 20 or 30%, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to struggle to make mortgage repayments and put food on the table and stuff. He says, where you're at right now, you've got the buffer to be able to do that. But you've got to make the decision to do that. You've got to put your health... First, because if you don't, something is going to bad is going to happen to you. And, you know, I've been listening to that podcast, the Alzheimer's and the heart attacks and all this sort of stuff. And I'm oh. starting, yeah, and I'm starting to think he's really got a point here. Yeah. And it took somebody like him, who I respected as a person and also as a very successful person himself, hmm. somebody you know, who thought, well, I know he works a lot, sort of thing. But for him to say, you've got to do this, otherwise you're going to yeah. blow up. Uh, to then do it so then I, I instigated um, I thought well what, how can I make some changes within what I'm doing um, our Monday morning session I thought well I, I'd committed to doing this Saturday morning session and it was less so out of choice initially and more so mm. out of pressure and what I mean by that was for 10 years I've wanted to run a, a Saturday morning session every year I go to the management and say can I run that Saturday morning session yes 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 this is your year this is your year and then it gets knocked flat, yeah. and I don't get it, and I haven't got it, and so because of that, I haven't been able to run yeah. a proper Rottnest solo swim squad, which is what I would like to have done in the past. And so I kept getting knocked, knocked back, knocked back, knocked back. Anyway, about eighteen months ago, the thing came up. If you get in your application this afternoon, we can pretty much guarantee that you're going to get some space on a Saturday morning. So I had to react and respond like that. Like like straight away, and the we'd always I'd always talk spoken with Sally about this as potentially her to take the Saturday morning session, mm. um, because I didn't really want to do it because I was already at max, max capacity. Yeah. Um, so 
and I hadn't also run it past my wife Michelle, <laughs> more importantly. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I just had to. I just said yes, and I thought oh, I'll work out the details. Sally will take it, and Michelle Michelle will know about it, but she doesn't need to worry about it because it's no. I'm not going to be out of the yeah, house yeah. any longer. And da da da. Anyway, and this is no discredit to Sally. Sally had in that interim period since we'd last talked about it, she's she's got a Sunday thing, so she doesn't work Saturday. Once works Saturday and Sunday, she works the Sunday. Yeah. Um, and then I'm suddenly left with I've already told people, yeah, and taken applications for this Saturday morning session. I've now got to commit. Yeah, commit. And, I've committed. I've got to see it through. And then I had the problematic thing I'm telling Michelle, and she was again to give her credit. She was she took it on the chin, sort of thing. It was like okay, you know. But she said she knew at that point that that's the start of a bit of a bit of a breaking point. So that's eighteen months ago, yeah. and it's like she already knew I was at Max. She thought thought it's where's, just, this going? where's this going? What's going? To, what's going to happen? So. It, I can't get rid. Of, I can't get rid of the Saturday. I love. I actually, it's one of my favourite sessions actually yes. to, to run. So, I've decided what I what I can do is. And Sally was open to do this, so she's now taken over my Monday sessions. So it allows me to have mm. a Sunday Monday weekend, which is actually working out really quite cool because yeah. I have the Sunday with the kids, and then I also get Mon- Michelle doesn't go to work on Monday until three o'clock. So we've actually started swimming together in the squad that I used to run yeah. with Sally coaching, me and Michelle having a session together, and then we go off and have lunch or whatever. And Brilliant. It's just stuff that we that we haven't done before. Yeah. And then Thursdays, Thursdays I used to when we moved uh, four years ago to this house. I thought right, I need to work an extra two or three hours to to make the difference jump up in the mortgage repayment so that's when I'll do it I'll do it on a Thursday Thursday used to be my admin day where I'd stay at home and, and just have time to myself and I ditched that for four years basically to make sure mm. and I've ditched it again now so I've actually ditched the, the coaching on a Thursday the one-to-one sessions which I used to do in favour of just having a little bit of time for a bit of planning and a bit of reflection and and it's all starting to make a, a, a big difference, difference. To, to how I'm actually feeling I mean I've still got the back pain and stuff but you know having those people chip in to me and say look you need to do this you need mm. to do that and and the other thing which I mentioned earlier on as well is about stepping back a little bit from the, the social media thing because I, I can I've through what I've gone through I can actually now see just how when people say oh everyone's life seems rosy on Facebook everyone, you know, I'm as guilty as the next man on the ground, yeah. yeah I'm particularly on the ground so I'm as guilty as the next man for having done that in the past and yeah. I almost look at it now and, and just feel sort of shameful like that's how I was doing it because I thought well you've got to show puff out your chest and mm. show that you so I've stepped it's all part of that program it's all part that of that running. you know and, like, and, and it, even before social media and stuff like that it would be you know, the classic keeping up with the Joneses type of thing so when I got back from uh, from Mallorca we'd been talking about when I made this sort of decision that I wanted to step back a bit in terms of the, the work volume that I was doing um We've been talking about trading in my 2005 Nissan X Trail, which is all getting a bit clunky and is worth about two grand now, to something a little bit nicer. And I was going to, you've got a, yours a Hilux, is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We've been eyeing this Hilux. So we went all the way down to uh, John Hughes and uh, looked at this thing, spent a couple of hours looking at it with the kids. And, you know, it's like 45, 50 grand, this thing. And I was trying to work out if we could afford it, whether to do payments or what have you. And we got to the point where we were actually sitting down about to sign the thing. And I just said, I'm really sorry, mate, I can't do this. I said, to, I turned around to Michelle, I said, I, I, I can't do this, I can't. I, she said, what do you mean? I said, well, if I'm thinking about pulling back in terms of the amount of work that I'm doing and, and essentially what I'm yeah. earning, the last thing I want is a $50,000 bill over my head for a car, which I probably don't really need. Let's just run this. And it was that was a, it might seem like a quite a small point, but for me that yeah. was a huge thing yeah. because I'd always aspired to having, yeah, you know, my dream car used to be a Tesla, yes. yeah, two hundred thousand dollars over here or whatever it is, sort of thing for the print for the pimped version, and I, you know, when somebody said to me, oh, what are you building for? What, what, when will you be successful? And I've always said, I'll be successful when I'm driving a Tesla, and the reality is, I won't be successful when driving a Tesla. I'll still be the same. I'll still yeah. be the stressed out guy trying to pay the repayments on the yeah. Tesla and stuff like that, you know. And so I know it sounds a little bit cliche saying that by. By recognizing this stuff and realizing that you know money isn't everything or success is how you define it, and yeah. a lot of us define it in a in the wrong way potentially. Mm. You know, to me, I have had that sort of a bit of a an epiphany, if you like, and it's all come from having this 
back issue, which yeah. just totally floored me, totally stopped me. Going through the depression that was in all associated with that. And, you know, I'm not out of the woods yet. And as my psychologist keeps r- r- telling me, you know, he says, you'll, your life goes up, you have these yeah. ups and downs. So it does anyway. It does, yeah. So it's not like, it's not like I'm fixed now, but I am fixing yeah. some of the things which have probably been causing a lot of the a lot of the, the issues that I've been having over the years. And, you know, I've I've fallen out with, um, not fallen out with friends, but lost friendship from people because I've been so driven and so competitive and so egotistical sort of thing that I haven't been a very nice guy to, to be around. And that's like finally seeing that and realising that it's not me. Sorry, it's not them, it's me. Yes, that, that was quite an eye-opening thing, and even yeah. even with a re- relationship with my wife, realizing that the the friction that we were feeling, I you know I was telling myself, oh, you know, it's Michelle, it's Michelle, it's Michelle. it wasn't oh, yeah, yeah. Michelle, the easiest person in the world. Yeah, to it's a blame. Yeah, yeah, someone else. Totally, yeah. But it yeah. was it wasn't her. It wasn't her at all. It's it's how I've been carrying myself, <clears> the pressure that I've been putting myself under with the, with the workload and stuff like that, coming home stressed and so you it's know, all fueled by the program you're running. Totally, you know. She said she would not often not like to come home after her work because she was nervous about how I would be, whether somebody had said something to me on Twitter or somebody had like, Ooh, sort of that's really yeah, hard, isn't I know, it? really hard. But like you know, and I and so it was like fuck, you know, I did it really need to be. Like such a big back injury to stop you. I. It's a really good question because I've been trying to. Because there was lots of data points before. There were lots of data points know. before that, but I don't I think I would have got. Two thousand and seventeen. Lucy bought me a one to one with you, mm. and I myself was just knackered with swimming. I'd yeah. done a solo, and then and I will talk about this in a minute because um, I got stuck in the identity of somebody who swam a solo. Right, right. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And 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 so I got stuck, and we'll come back to it in just a sec. And so I immediately went, all oh, right, well, I don't want to do a solo next year, but uh, what's next with a duo? Yeah. And, you know, I started a new relationship with Lucy, yeah. and she's a gun swimmer, and it's all like, doo, 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 doo. in fact, I think I asked her before we kissed, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so we went into it, and da 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 and I really didn't, come down from the solo and I just kept swimming and I swam through winter I was down at polar bears smashing out winter badges trying to crank out like two or three k's even in like this time of year in you know the whole thing I was like oh, I'm keep going because I was stuck in it I was stuck yeah, in it yeah, yeah. and then she bought me this one to one and I remember I remember saying to her, just she's oh when are you going to do it you're going to do it before the duo and and my shoulders were breaking down I was totally trapped in my body I was trapped in the min- yeah, the cycle. nature yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of of swimming and the identity that was stuck with it, and and I remember just going and and it was all in my name, and I remember emailing you and going, look, I'm just knackered. It would be just wasted waste. on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I actually gave the present back. Yeah, right to Lucy. I was like, she's never been. She's an awesome swimmer. She'll get fucking shit tons out of this. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. I remember emailing you and just going. Oh, I'm just so knackered with swimming. I can't do it. Is it all right if we swap the names? And you were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this blog post I've written. And it was all about being fatigued. And I think you were getting tired with swimming. Yeah, that was. That was that year, yeah. Stuff like that. And I remember at the time just thinking, there's a dude who's in a similar place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then obviously, you know, you keep chucking along, chucking along, you know. But um, yeah, yeah, so we talk about all these data points. Mm. Um... Did it have to be such a severe backache that crippled you, that brought you to your knees, that stopped the family holiday, that dragged you to tears, that that left you defenceless on the pool deck when yeah. somebody goes, your work's bullshit? Yeah, yeah. You know, you look at it all. <clears throat> it, there was a lot. There's a lot amounting there, and I think this is why, um, why you know, why my mate sent me that text saying, "Don't over dramatise," because they only see. Yeah, the back pain or the, the, the back ache or, the, or yeah. what have you. They don't see everything that's sort of accumulated. Mm. And I think this is, you know, somebody once said to me, you know, that they, everyone's dealing with shit and you yeah. think that you're the only person dealing with <laughs> yeah. shit in your life and that everyone else is walking around and just because they're not talking about the shit they're dealing with. It doesn't, it, it means that they're, that they're fine sort of thing. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I think, um, 
ultimately, it, I mean, ultimately, it did take all of that. But mm. I, I was just thinking there about one of the points I sort of missed earlier on when you're talking about the drive. And this is probably quite sort of formative, really, in the sense that when I was a kid, and when we're going back as early as what my little boy is now, about 10 and 11, because I was so fanatical about swimming, I was... I was never a great swimmer, it has to be said. So as a, as a kid doing sprints and stuff, I was never a great swimmer. But I think what I was actually in love with was the routine and yes. the training and the notion that I could get better if I trained harder. And I remember um, when I was, I think it was 11, uh, it, it came on the scene that there's a local a, a coach who was 30 miles or 50 k's or whatever away from us who had just been employed by the swimming team down the road there, 50 k's away, um, who was being paid £24,000 to be a full-time swim coach, right. which back in 1989, 1990, is a Tidy. huge amount of money. Like, like huge. And I, I remember then thinking, well, I want to go and train with this guy because he's brilliant. And the reality was I never actually trained with him because he ended up being like the head coach and had loads yeah. of the feeder coaches underneath him. I, was, I wasn't good enough to swim with him and his squad. But it, it sort of seeded a little bit of an idea in my head that, you know, wow, you know, this guy, yeah. he could earn a, a, a good wage and stuff like that. And then, so then from that, I, because I wanted to clear my diary, as it were, to allow me to focus on the swimming, every time we'd ever get any homework at school, so I was 11, 12, 13 years of age, I wouldn't go out and play at lunchtime and I wouldn't go out at break time. I'd actually sit in the library and do right. the homework so that I could get, so that my mum could pick me up, take me fifty kilometres down the road. She'd sit there and go shopping or 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 do whatever she would do, sort of thing. I would train for two hours, then we'd come home. We'd do that three times a week, and then the other eight sessions or whatever I was swimming, which was you know swimming a lot, mm. you know, I'd do with the local with the local club. But I think that drive there, and that's irrespective of all this other stuff, like the the want to be a successful swimming coach, and so. It's just a drive to want to be the best that I could be, but mm. taken way too far to the nth degree. I mean, yeah. like I would never suggest now that my kids stay at stay indoors, yeah, and forgo their lunch break. Yeah, my, I don't think my parents knew I was doing that, but I yeah. was doing it, and it was that was driven by no one else other than me. <clears throat> ultimately, yeah, I wanted to do that, and I felt like you know, and I remember somebody asking me, "Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this?" Why don't you come outside and play? And part, part of it was I, was I was never any good at soccer, for example. And soccer mm. was the big thing you know, and rugby at the school. And I was rubbish at both of those two sports. So I'd always, when they lined up and you get picked, I was always the last kid to get picked. So I didn't want to do a sport like that, which I wasn't yeah. very good at. I'd prefer to be well, the, <laughs> no, I'd prefer to be the weird kid who could swim. You know, he was the only yeah. kid in the school who could swim, but that was a bit different. You know, and I quite liked that sort of thing. And um, so somebody said, "So why are you doing this?" And I said, "Well, I just want to make sure that I I can get a good job when I you know when I finish school and stuff like that." So at the age of ten or eleven, yeah. I'm thinking about earning money and wanting to get a good job and be successful, yeah. sort of thing, to the point where I actually forgo lunch breaks and yeah. afternoon breaks, morning breaks. It's already stuff formed. Like that. It's already there. forming then, you know, yeah. and that's that's thirty that's years started, ago now. Started the program. Started all, all of that. Yeah. So here's thing I want to check past you. Um, Obviously, your, your life with um, sport and stuff, very achievement focused. Very, yeah. Your business is achievement focused. Yeah. You know, um, people come in, they, they're they swimming faster and, yeah. they're, and they're measuring and, you know, you're a big component, proponent of the bleeper. And, yes, yeah, and, yeah. And stuff yeah. like that. It's measure, measure, measure. It's achievement, achievement, achievement. And one of the things I found, and, and the best example I can give you, the most relevant one, is... Um, my rottenness solo mm. swim journey, right? You know, so I decided in, in September and then like, I do believe in a bigger, bigger higher intelligence. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. boy, did it provide me with a, with a fantastic um, rottenness experience. Yeah. Because I started doing the training and I'm doing it. I'm just, I mean, the, I, I started early and I didn't ramp up my load. So I just was, Feeling stronger and gradually doing it and I was doing a little bit of you know support work and stuff and then the best gift which was the shittest gift at the time <laughs> the best gift at the time was I was made redundant by Chevron at the oh, end of man. November and then started what you, you can't find a job in 
No, you in, couldn't in at that December, time. January. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, December, January, why don't I push it out of February as well? Because I've got a solo on the horizon. So now I'm swimming, I'm coming back, I'm spending at least 25 minutes on the roller after, <laughs> you know, probably 10 minutes for every hour I'm swimming. You're a you professional know, swimmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like my whole life was around this whole whole thing, right? Um. And, you know, I took myself seriously. I took the whole thing seriously because, you know, swimming 20 k's in the open water to the island is, is not to be mucked around, you know. And, and there's part of me that's really liked the whole turning up of crap weather and sharks in the last yeah, couple yeah. of years just to chill everybody down a bit about <laughs> the enormity of what that yeah. actually is. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so you go through this process, you know, and I created, I looked at, I looked at your training schedule, a few other training schedules. Mm. I made my own training schedule. I've got my Excel spreadsheet. I'm measuring it. Mm. I know I did 527 kilometers before I stood on the beach <laughs> in, in Puzzle. You know, I'm getting needling every other week. And my, yeah. I got a friend who's a nutrition, Nick Nation. He came and looked at my nutrition. We were measuring my weight before and after I swam. How many times did I piss in the water? Yeah, yeah. The whole nine yards, we worked out how much, you know. Just took the whole thing seriously. Yeah, right? yeah. And the process magic yeah it was magical and, and you know i was blessed i didn't have the you know interruption of work yeah to get in the way so the whole thing was just you know took the whole thing and with it me and everything about it and it became a much deeper and spiritual journey yeah right. you know you speak to you know there were there were four five of us who did it including lucy i met lucy in the ocean right. during this whole yeah, thing which is saying, yeah. my fiance and and you know you speak to any of them like I was referred to as Zen Brin like yeah right <laughs> out there in the ocean all the time and doing stuff and you know and look it was a magical 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 experience and even the day was a magical experience you know I'd spent so much time with my head in the water thinking through everything I needed to do hmm. it, it, I just made it happen right through to my dad on the boat daughter and mother turning up. With Shelley Taylor Smith on a yeah. boat, and hey, keep going, la, la, la. It's mega the whole thing. And then there was, I had this presence of mind two weeks out, right, to to um, start to take stock of some of the things that I really enjoyed about the process. And one of them was this whole, I was in a very calm state of mind, and I was thinking, well, maybe I should go and hit up some meditation. I'd played in meditation right. many times, but yeah. I was like, maybe I should hit up some meditation and double down on that again because. This is something I want to keep going yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. And then I took then I took on board the worst piece of advice from a really well meaning friend, which was, Well, if you like if if swimming gives you that meditative thing, why don't you keep swimming? Uh, yeah. It's like, oh fuck, I didn't think about that. Yeah. The most obvious thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. But afterwards, like afterwards, um, you know, the it's it's amazing, you know, within hours of completing something and going across the line, you know. I always refer to it as you suddenly lose the key to the top drawer of performance. Like you think, oh, you know, I'm probably going to crack another 10K swim out next week after the event. Yeah. But no, you, you can't find the key that opens the drawer yeah. to that performance. It's gone <laughs> yeah. and you just can't find it. It yeah. is no longer there. Yeah. In fact, you can't get to the several top drawers. And the thing I found most interesting is, is and I've seen it in friends and I've seen it in myself because, you know, the solo is not the first enduro row achievement no. trip I've yeah sure done and it's not just in sport it's been in other areas as well you commit yourself it's almost to me i've noticed and i've had to stop signing up to things for <laughs> for a year and a half um it's almost like when you sign up to hit an achievement it's great because you, you have to evolve and you have to take yourself seriously you take yourself care seriously your nutrition, probably sleep, you know, how you do stuff, da, 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 da. you all take it seriously and you do because you've got this permission slip, even mm. down to turning up at a barbecue in Australia and people go, oh, do you want a beer? And you're like, uh, no, I've got a swim I'm training tomorrow. for a swim. I'm training yeah. for a swim. So you get a free pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get yeah. the free pass from not having to go through that social awkwardness of, well, why don't you want a beer? Yeah, yeah. That's very good. <laughs> and now you're making me feel awkward. But you have this. And so you have this achievement Right, and the achievement almost gives you the permission slip to take yourself and your life so very seriously yeah, yeah. and focus on it beyond the mundane and letting it just run and this, that and the other. But then you kind of like it. And then the actual achieving bit can actually be quite hollow for a lot of people. Mm. And, 
you know, getting there was awesome, but it was also kind of sad as well. At, yeah, you know, yeah. the end of the journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this, that, and the other. And then you try, and then you like trying to grab for the next one. So for me, it was the duo the next year, which was awesome, mm. but it was never the solo. Never yeah, yeah. And I see a lot of friends, particularly, you know, you go through the whole, oh, I've just done a sprint triathlon, do a few of those. I'm going to do Olympic. But yeah. Now I'm going to do a half Ironman. I guess where I'm going next? Yeah. I'm going to the Ironman. You get there, that's like, what am I going to do next? Yeah. And because you're in this process and everybody talks about, oh, I just love the training. I love the process. This yeah, yeah. How do we get to just focus on the process for the process sake when you don't need the permission slip of the achievement at the end to take yeah, yourself yeah. so fucking seriously. I know, I know. Does I, that resonate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because you will see a lot of this. Oh, totally, yeah. Well, I see, a lot of it my, I see a lot of it in myself. Yeah, first and also and in your clients. Yeah, 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 you, know, you, yeah. See, you know, they do they do the first roller, rock nest solo swim and I know people who've done six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm just like, oh, boring. I think the interesting thing, uh, like recognizing triathlon and the triathletes that I coach, they reckon the average lifespan of a triathlete is two and a half years. And certainly over here in WA, where we've got access to an Ironman on our doorstep, the classic thing to hear somebody who might be a CEO, for example, somebody highly driven, yeah. saying, I want to get into triathlon, I want to set myself a challenge. They don't go to a sprint and then an Olympic and then a half hour. Yeah. They actually go straight to the full thing. Yeah. Boom. And they'll maybe take some time off work and they'll train up for the for the Ironman. And it will, it'll be, yeah. they'll get injured. They'll go through the processes that, the, the, the things, issues that all of us face when we're doing it. Yeah. But they will have this lead up and they will do this race at the end of it. And then the sustainability of that training for that, for that big event into the year two often then starts to wane they st- they've lost that key like you say yeah. I love that and Howard actually I'm going to steal it from you <laughs> um, they'll lose some of that and it, the second year just won't match up as well then maybe they're getting injured more often mm. more frequently sort of thing or they might decide to go and do an Ironman in a different country or what have you but there is a high burnout from Ironman specifically because it's mm. just not sustainable over time interesting that you mentioned there about solo swimmers have done 8, 9, 10 solos across to Rotnest. What I see differently about them is something which I don't see in myself at all. Mm. And I'm almost jealous that I don't see it in myself in the sense that I've done four solos now and I've done some of the big marathon swims and stuff. But with each of them, I put myself on a very dedicated, very strict program. And um, especially Manhattan, that that was like a, a dream training program. And I ended up having the dream result at the end of it. Yeah. But um, the, the the process for me was very much the goal, as in, you know, I've got this goal, this big event, I'm going to get myself to the best possible shape. But then afterwards, I'd actually fall off a bit of a cliff mm. and not really know what to do with myself for a while. The people I see doing those multiple events, 8, 9, 10, they don't come across as taking themselves that seriously you know Mm. they will turn up for all the training sessions and stuff but they're not the guy wanting to lead the lane wanting to measure and get the data points and all that sort of stuff all the time um the more you know some of them even go into some of the solo swims thinking oh i've only done six weeks of training but you know whatever you know i'll just go out there and i'll just i'll just enjoy it they just literally just want to go from a to b and go through that process and i think in many ways, I think that's very admirable because that's not me yeah. at all. I can't do that. I just, I just can't do that because part of me, as a, as a sports scientist, believes that well, actually, that might be dangerous to do that to not prepare properly and to yeah. not have done it. So yeah. that's definitely a and it's a very valid thing that chips away in my head thinking you need to prepare because your sports science degree has shown you that if you periodize like this and build up like that you'll get yourself to a safe level to actually but these guys aren't bothered about they're not talking about doing it fast or you know they're just wanting to to Mm. do it and in in many ways for a lot of those like let's take some of these eddie izzard for example so on one of our yeah absolutely 50 marathons or 47 marathons i think he did or something like that on, on consecutive days and you know greg white who was my professor at university um was his coach for that and he you know he he had absolutely zero experience of running but he was almost getting fitter right. each training session or each marathon rather that he was doing was a training session which yes. where he got fitter and fitter and fitter and just watched this thing on netflix about this iron cowboy who did 50 consecutive ironman in 50 days in 50 different states around the u.s like 
you can't even get your head around it. So he would literally do an Ironman, which would take him, he wasn't doing them particularly fast, but he'd do them in like 15, 16 hours, for example. And then he would sleep in the van whilst his mates drove him to the next state and then he'd do it again. And then he'd do it again. And he'd do that for 50 days in a row. And, you know, I mean, that is like, there was a lot of controversy on there about things like, you know, he's got four children and like, aren't you being a bit selfish and da da da? And the questions about whether or not he, the drips that he was putting himself on on the evening was considered drug or doping or performance enhancing and all this sort of stuff. Mm. But his attitude to doing each day was not like, I need to hold a certain pace or do it. It was just like all he did was he said, I've got to keep my heart rate under, I think it was 130 on the run and under 110 or something on the bike. And he was just poodling along and whatever happened, happened. And like that with the with the solo swimmers who do it time and time again, you know, some of them get have still have brilliant results, but they're not really focused on the result. Yeah. They're just focused on their, their process for them is actually just swimming from A to B <clears> and <throat> just being part of the event because they like the buzz of the, yeah. of the event. But that's definitely not me. And mm. I, I'd love to get to that point where I could yeah. where I could do that but but I guess I, where I was, part of where I was driving was um, why can't we just take the process as seriously and the process well, say I, I think I, I think the, the point on that what I was what I um, where I was getting to I guess is the for me there's a lot of ego tied up in the result a lot yeah so for me to <clears throat> not be able to enjoy the process and be more focused on the goal it's all tied up in you know I want to be the best or I want to finish in the top 10 or I want to finish with a certain time and that type Mm. of thing so you know I I do love the process but I love the goal more And and I think it is the wrong way I do think in reflection on all this stuff I do think it is the wrong way it's not my outlook is clearly not sustainable yes you know, and it hasn't been for a long, long time. Um, and the, the the people who you look at who do enjoy that type of thing, who do enjoy just the process, you know, they're the guys who are doing it for uh, guys and girls who are... You know, the social element is, is a huge part of it. For me, given the fact that I coach most of these people, when I come to train, I've got to do it by myself. So my the little bleepers and stuff, you know, they become my friends. They become my virtual yeah. training partners, but they can be a, a one unto themselves sort of thing. Because if you're not making the times, you're not making the targets. Yeah. Then you start to get stressed, and you get start to get a little bit. Oh, yeah. You, know, you, you, you get a bit down on yourself on that front. But yeah, I I did I got into this sport of um, swim run back in 2016. Excuse me, 2016, where you're actually partnered and tethered up with somebody mm. else. And that's quite a unique thing in the world of endurance racing because nine times out of ten you're doing it by yourself. On this particular event, you tie it, literally tethered to somebody. You swim from one island, run across the island, swim to the next island, go on and so forth. And the first one I did in 2016 was with a friend whose daughter was unfortunately suffering from quite severe leukemia. She was eight years of age. And I wasn't terribly fit and done running for a long time. And, and because of his situation, he wasn't able to be very fit so when we started for the first time in my life the gun went off and I just let everyone go like we were just jogging along and like just sort of soaking up the scenery I'd never in my life ever done that before ever I've never smelled the roses ever and and to be perfectly fair I've never done that out even outside of an event I've been charging ahead with the business and charging ahead and I'm not like soaking it up or or not enjoying it as much as I should do you know as we should all do sort of thing you know and and that is what happiness is right is that is that enjoying of that process and enjoying the stuff going wrong and yet to me I've been thinking well I'll be happy when I get that particular result or I win that particular race or earn that you know earn that Tesla or whatever it might be that is Mm. not what Happy, you know, it's taken this to to sort of start to realize that. And I'm not like I keep saying, I'm not fixed. I'm not gonna. I'm not. No one's ever jumping fixed, around, man. clapping your hands like <laughs> this, big smile on my face the whole time, sort of thing. But I am actually starting to appreciate that. And when we did that race, it was it was great because everyone shot off, and we were like almost we we're in the back half of the field and stuff. And then we did the first swim, and it was a longer swim, and suddenly we were up in like twelfth or thirteenth position, you know, because the swim had gone okay. And then we held that position all the way through. But even though we were then essentially performing at that point because we do, both of us then got in our head. Well, we're doing all right here. Let's keep pushing. Oh, on. now the goals clicked in. <laughs> yeah, but 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 even then, on that particular day, I was still able to sort mm. of look around and go. Oh, 
you know, we're on the Atlantic Ocean is there on a massive backdrop and isn't this amazing? I'm doing it with this guy whose daughter's suffering from this and 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 it was it was good. It was a really good I still struggled a lot, like yeah. towards the tail end of it. I wasn't fit enough for it and, and I've done other swim run events where I've not been fit enough for it as well. But I remember you know, very fondly remember doing that particular event and thinking I'm enjoying just the pro as opposed to the the, the goal because we didn't have we didn't yeah. go into it with any goal all the time we're normally going with the goal on that particular event and you wasn't i might not even survive it i might not even get yeah. around it and it's for, for the first time ever i've never you know, i've always prepared myself well enough yeah. to not just survive it but to perform in it so yeah it's i i would when i see people enjoying squad sessions and stuff and having chit chats and not worrying about the people or maybe not even choosing to choose the people we just I've just invented these yes. swimming caps <laughs> yes. for that very reason. Yes. So these these swimming caps are Green reversible. Gold. <laughs> so, <laughs> so on one side it's blue, which means that you're happy to receive feedback from the coach, or you're happy to take the bleeper and actually lead. And on the flip side, it's bright orange, and bright orange means just leave me alone. I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. You don't need to worry <laughs> yeah. too much about me. I'm all right doing what I'm doing sort yeah. of thing. So people, like sometimes somebody will change it halfway through the set because their mood changed or whatever. Yeah. We call them mood swimming caps sort of thing. Yeah. But for me on the pool deck, it's quite, it's quite, it's actually quite liberating as a coach because it's, I'm not trying to, um, you know, convince somebody, oh, you need to take the bleeper when they're clearly showing yeah. orange. I mean, we've had situations where the whole lane is wearing orange and then I've still had to decide who somebody <laughs> yes, needs to lead the it. lane somebody has to lead the lane sort of thing but it has it has put an interesting perspective on it and you know it, it's fair to say that a lot of the people who um, who are wearing the orange at the back of the lane you know they're having a little bit more of that social interaction and stuff and that's fine you know to me in my head it's no you've got to spend your time training but yeah. I had a scenario just, just this week we I mentioned me and Michelle are now swimming together on a Monday in the pure technique session so it's just drills and stuff like yeah. that and it's a it's quite a hard session to coach because you are trying to give feedback on people's strokes and stuff like that but I wasn't coaching I was just going to be swimming and we decided that we're going to make a bit of a date day of it we we're going to swim together and then go to the movie and watch that new Tarantino movie which mm. I don't know if you've seen it is uh, don't waste your time <laughs> <laughs> Second yeah. anyway yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was a bit disappointed anyway but I was all filled up with this enjoy, uh, this um, focus and goal that it would be really enjoyable because I love Tarantino. Yeah. So we were due to swim at 9.30 to 10.30, but the movie started at 10.30. So me and Michelle decided that we're going to go down at about 8.45, get the session in because I'd already written it up on the board for Sally to deliver, and we'd see them, the other swimmers, but we'd actually be in the lane next to them. We'd just say, hey, you know, we're going yeah. to a movie. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it took me about half an hour, believe it or not, to buy these bloody cinema tickets in the car park so by the time we get onto the pool deck everyone's milling around ready to start the 9.30 session yeah. and I'm getting all stressed because I want to get in and I want to get my 3,000 metres in and stuff like that Yeah. And, uh, and Michelle could sense the stress that I was actually going through and stuff and Sally could even sense it she's gone Paul just get in and get started I know you don't like people to start before 9.30 but just get in and get started and so I started and I went through the first couple of hundred metres I was like oh, I've got to get it in got to get it in and then something clicked I was like why do I actually need to do this? Like, yeah. Uh, does it really matter if I do three thousand meters or two thousand meters? I'm not training for an event. I'm going to go and enjoy the cinema, yeah. And I don't want to rush through getting changed quickly and racing there and be five minutes late. I'm just gonna, so then I stopped. I actually stopped and let, you know everybody and then sort of caught up within the lane. And yeah. We just went through. And Michelle said, oh, "I thought you wanted to get on with it. I thought you were, come on, come on, come on." I said. I said I'm alright with this I'm orange actually alright I'm alright I've got the orange cap on I'm alright with it and you know for that that was a little bit of a and that was only a big breakthrough week. it's Paul. a bit of a breakthrough like a silly little yeah. breakthrough sort of thing but a bit of a breakthrough this week and um, you know I've been swimming with Sally on occasion as well since I've been back as, as I'm trying to get back some fitness and my, you know, my swimming's appalling at the moment but um, Sally says right let's do 10 300s we swam together and I got to I think I got to 6 or 7 and I thought I could just feel my back niggling a little bit and I thought that's enough that's yep. it I'll jump out that's I'll enough now that'll do and I've never done that ever yeah I've got to finish it and I've got to do oh, more as well get trapped in the mind and then the mind goes yeah. and then the mind and then the body goes this uh, the lady Stephanie who I mentioned the Paralympian um, we had a really really good um, discussion on the second night uh, when we all got for dinner together and she was getting quite in depth talking about you know, what it's like living with you know to have been born with one leg and and the the practicalities of that and her, her competition and training and all that sort of stuff 
And I was like sat really quite close to her and just I was I didn't I wasn't saying anything, I was just like sort of in awe listening to this story. And I was like, What's she got on her thing? There's something on her finger there. And I was like, What is that? I just said, What is that on your finger? And she's got this tattoo on the inside of her finger and it just says the word enough. Mm. And it's like so then I said, well, you know, what does that mean? And she just opened up about this whole idea that, you know, she she is also a very goal-driven and has been a very goal-driven to get these gold medals and world records and stuff like that. But at that point, when she was finishing her career in, in swimming, you know, she was realising that she'd lost some of the love for it and da 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 and that she's come to this point in her life where she recognises, and she's only in her mid-30s sort of thing, but recognises that, you know, she is enough in, yes. you know, for years and years, obviously, the, the stigma of, you know, of you know, of being born with one leg and, mm. and people looking at her funny and, and all these sort of things. She's she's dealt with that and, and coped with that and all these sort of things. So a part of the enough is her body as it is, is enough. Mm. But she meant it a little bit more spiritually than that as well about, you know, you are enough and, uh, you know, we're all enough and, and stuff like that. And, and she's, I, I just saw that and thought, wow, how cool is that? And it's actually on her ring finger as well. Right. So she talks about this idea that she's, she is enough in herself without having been married to somebody, for example, or being yeah. a partner to somebody, you know, and, and just talking about that a little bit deeper. And to me, it, I, I've been thinking a lot about that in terms of, you know, well, I, I, from the outside, people looking in, you said earlier on, you know, you've got a, a hot wife and you've got, yeah. <laughs> and you've got, and you've got kids and you've got a house and you've got, a job which is like a, a cool job and stuff like that and yet the reality is that I'm telling you right now that I haven't been happy because I've been pushing for more 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 more, more more it hasn't been enough and yet through reflection and stuff and realizing from you know friends saying it's all right to drop down 20 30 percent you're not going to die sort of thing yeah. but if you can regain a little bit of your soul <laughs> basically yeah then then that might start to be enough and you might start yeah. to realize that it is enough because a lot of people and i know that i'm not stupid sort of thing i know that i know that from an outside in people would be looking and thinking what the why the hell is he getting all depressed and stuff like that why has he got this bad back keep it in perspective mate you know and you know don't over dramatize and stuff but it's yeah but that that to me is just another mechanism that takes the focus away from the key point which yeah. is you got this thing. It's this been drive, driving this you. drive, you know. And yeah, I think even just recognizing in myself this notion that I am a workaholic. You know, it was I said earlier on. I, I some would say it was a Freudian slip saying alcoholic. You know, a workaholic. But it's all addiction, right? It's all yeah. like, you know, people think of uh, how how bad is workaholism compared to alcoholism or drug addiction or or what have you. I. I started. Well, it, it, it still can consume you and eat you up, and like you know, and and ruin friendships and relationships, and and your health, which it has been doing yeah. for me and stuff. And so how's that different to being an alcoholic? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, you, you said this is like an AA meeting here, but do you know in Perth in WA there is no Workaholics Anonymous. There yeah. is no. And I joked saying that you know everyone would be too busy to come along to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, in the other states around Australia, there are places where people can go and actually chat about this sort of stuff and you know i i i used to wear it as a badge of honor you know oh he works hard and he's grown this and he's done that and he sleeps four hours a night and stuff like that and you know he flies off to the hardcore hard as hardcore and he flies off to nike and do, you know the the ironic thing with all of that is that you know i i still wasn't happy with all of that i was stressed i was ruined my body was ruined my relationships were falling apart friendships were falling apart and stuff like that and i you know i've, I've part of this process gabby said you're gonna this is gonna be the making of you this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to you and i'm thinking that at the time i'm thinking what the hell do you know but now i'm actually starting to see some of that and you know i mean talk is cheap you've got to make those changes it's all very well me professing this to you on this yeah. podcast sort of thing but i am making those mm. changing. I still have low points. I still have things where I think, you know, um, you know, find myself getting stressed or anxious about something. Like I say about the cinema tickets the other day. And, yeah. But then trying to catch myself and just trying to trying to see it. And and you know that's that's my psychologist Peter is just brilliant at and has been over the last six years at trying to show mm. you. Okay, well this is so long as you can recognize it. You can't necessarily stop it, but you can recognize it and acknowledge it and do something with it as opposed to letting it consume yes. you. Yes 
then so you're driving the bus, not sitting on the back, that, letting the bus drive itself. That's exactly right, you know. And and through all of this, you know, I almost flipped completely the opposite way, to the point where I thought. I'm just going to give this all away and I'm going to go and I've got this t-shirt on right now. It's a little VW combi sort yeah. of thing. I literally, we, we've talked about buying a camper van for years and, and traveling. That's how our first um, holiday together yeah. was in a camper van going around Tasmania. And Michelle and myself went around Europe together for a year in a, in a, camp, a crappy old camper van as well. And we talked about, you know, I've started to think, well, maybe just give all this away and just go off in, right off into the sunset and, and just do something like that. And I started thinking about, you know, I've, when I went traveling around the world when I was 23 to eventually end up here, um, I said, tell everyone I was going to India and, and Nepal to go and find myself, man. And I grew my hair long, had the big beard, and yeah. I was like trying to be this hippie and stuff. And I never really found myself, as it were, during that period and stuff. But I thought now is the time that this is what I'm going to do. So I was all keying up to thinking I'm going to make this big change, and that's hence the reason with this with this whole um, email that I was drafting that I was going to send to the send out to the squad. It was almost preparing people to understand that if I do make this change, I want you to understand why you know where it's come from. I'm not just suddenly making this weirdo snap decision to go and live in a bus for the rest of my life. You know this is where <laughs> it's coming from. Anyway, so <laughs> I, I went to Michelle sent me over this uh, thing. She said, "There's this uh, movie playing in the." Um, I think it was in the Lunar or one of the art houses a little while back. She said, maybe we should go and watch this together. It's all about Buddhism and going and finding yourself. It's called Walk With Me. I don't know if you've yeah. seen it. Have you seen it? No. You should watch it because it changed my opinion completely. <laughs> because I was all ready to, I was thinking, yeah, I'm in this space now where I want to maybe sort of think about that being as a possible reality. And and I went there and it was, it's quite a moving movie um, it's all very hush and quiet. You hear these. There's this one Buddhist monk walking along at the, at the start, and everyone else is walking alongside him in total silence. And he's walking at like point one of a kilometer an hour, glacial like pace. yeah, to, total <laughs> glacial pace. And that's and the movie like there's no audio at all, other than the crunching of the feet for about five minutes. And it's um, what's he called um, Sherlock Holmes. Um, the British actor um, who played Sherlock Holmes in all the recent TV oh, shows, yeah. Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch, yes, Cumberbatch. Or, yeah, he's brilliant. Benedict so he's doing Cumberbatch. the Benedict Cumberbatch. That's it. Yeah. So he's doing all the audio uh, narration and stuff, and they're talking about how you know people go to see this Buddhist uh, monk guy, and they they learn to strip themselves of uh, mobile phones and possessions, and yep. they just go and live this life where there's none of those distractions where there, there, these are a lot of these people are people like me who've gone through some sort of burnout or mental yeah. breakdown or whatever you want to call it sort of you. thing and they just want to leave it all behind and they just want to go and start so I was, I'm watching this thing thinking oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the but then I thought well I can see what he's getting out of it the guy who's leading it because he's, he is actually helping other people find freedom or balance yeah. in their life or what have you but what are they at what are all those individual people who are stepping away from society what are they actually achieving from it for anything other than just themselves and they might need to do that and i'm, mm. I'm not saying you know if you are listening to this and you are yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I, i'm not, not trying to in my head though i was thinking well yeah i feel like i want to step away at the moment but i don't want to do that for the rest of my life because i feel and it brought me back to this idea that what is it that's driving me why do i do what i do and why i do what i do is because i want to genuinely help as many people as i possibly can coach and if i step away like that i would not coach sorry to swim but if i do step away like that then i won't actually be able to do Do any of that it'll all be just about me (laughs) so the greatest irony is that a lot of this a lot of this recognition epiphany whatever you want to call it it's all about me recognizing how self-focused I've been and how egotistical I've been to want to grow it and stuff like that and to do this and to do that. I've been very selfish and mm. I can see that now. But I almost saw some degree of selfishness. If I was to go a step away into this van and just drive away into the sunset, even potentially by myself, that would be 
the epitome to me of of, this of, that, of that selfishness. So, so I watched the movie, and within two hours, it was like, no, that is not your path. That is not what you're not <laughs> going to go and do that now. Again. Sorry, you know, it's just nuggets, but yeah, not yeah, for yeah, me. not not for me. And it might be for other people, but it wasn't for me. And and I, I followed that up the next day. I went and had a Reiki session. I've never had a Reiki session before. I went and did the energy balance and stuff. Yeah. I walked out of there, and the lady said. Um, I'm just delete. I'm just going to be deleting stuff. We had a chat about some of this stuff, and uh, and just deleting stuff. And I walked out there thinking, did any of that? Did it actually work? Was any of that? You, but that's the whole point. You don't really know. And I, I felt a little bit lighter, I guess, walking out. There. But I had this immediate compulsion that I n- must now go on to get my tarot cards read. Oh, <laughs> so I went right down the rabbit hole. I went, now, I went right down the rabbit hole. Yeah, so, no science in that. Yeah. So I went up to, exactly. So I went up to I went up to Hillary's. Um, and just booked in a session with with a, with a random uh, medium, and the the, the, fun, the the crazy thing with all of this is that my when I was a kid and I was talking about all the, that homework and stuff, the person who would pick me up from school and make me dinner before my mum would take me to swim was my grandma, and my grandma believed that she was quite psychic and had this medium side of things about her, and you know, and she was literally my my best friend growing up as a as a you know 11 to sort of 16 year old even a little bit older than that before she passed unfortunately and the first thing this this medium started saying she says there's somebody in the room with us right now (laughs) and her name is rose and she's your grandma and i was like holy fuck because it she was called rose and she is my grandma science and (laughs) you know and and i was like Ooh, okay so then I started listening to her and she she picked up on all the this, this stress and stuff that I've been going through and she wasn't really asking any questions as well and you know this is me talking about this this whole idea of you know I don't believe in the universe speaking and stuff and but some of the stuff that she's saying I was like oh, and can definitely relate to, to this 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 and this um and then she said, you're confused about something, aren't you? You're not sure about what pathway to take. And she said, I don't know if it's a relationship thing. I don't know if it's a career thing. Anyway, she boiled it down to it was more the, the relationship confusion about all the stuff that I'm dealing with with the work all is in. But she very prominently said, you must not give up your career because that is... And she didn't know what I did. I wasn't yeah. wearing a thing. I she, she said, "You are. this is what you were meant to do and that is, and you must keep following that. I can mm. see it and da 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 so of course, that's that. and then so since that tarot card reading, I've then been, you know, trying to work through relationship, not just here at home, but friendships and, and yeah. all these sort of things as well, and just trying to become a. I know it sounds cliche to say, but become a better version of of me by recognizing some of these major faults that I've mm. that I've had. So um, yeah, um, yeah, I did the full went the full full nine yards there. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. So, do you think um, can you see this making even now? Can you see this making you a adding new layers to your coaching? Definitely, yeah. And and I've seen it already. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it already with just the conversations that I'm having with people are less about the bleeper and the times that they're holding, and more about how they are themselves. And yeah, you know, I. I want to, and I've I've really enjoyed opening up, up a lot more with other people, mm. going for coffees, going closing you know, the gap between yeah. home pool and presenting pool. That's exactly right. Closing it down, which you know, it's a very good. I hadn't thought of it like that, but yeah, no, absolutely, mm. and um, and just in just like just enjoying that. You know, in the past, I'd always be telling myself, I haven't got time for anything extraneous. I've got to move on to the next session and I've got to do this. And but by creating a little bit of breathing space, I've been able to look a little bit more at those things. Mm. And, and there's still, you know, I and, and this this is why I wanted to do the podcast. This is why I wanted to, you know, if there's only one person listening there who sees himself as a entrepreneur or whatever and yeah. is doing it by themselves and can sort of heed some of these words of warning mm. about some of the stuff well, I think you know, it's but, if I'm honest Paul listen to you I don't think it's just applicable to entrepreneurs it can be applicable to anybody who's drive 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 mm. whether it's um, whether it's in a career in a corporate environment whether it's an entrepreneur whether it's Training to swim, training to do an Ironman, training to do something. You know, I. A lot of people say that the mind is a very powerful thing. Yeah. I would actually change that 
um, because I've, I've opened up to the difference between power and force. Right. Force tires after a while, but yeah. power will just keep going. Okay. And I find that the mind is a very forceful thing. Yep. And, you know, the force towards achievements. Do, 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 do. But if you can, after a while, that will tire because it will come from a place in a mind. And I think underneath that, we have power. Mm. And if you can dip into genuine, authentic power yeah which is probably what gets some of those guys over to rottenness for eight nine yeah, ten yeah, times yeah. because they just it's just there channel it yeah, from yeah, within yeah. themselves it, it is just them it's not externally driven it's not the mind and the chatter in the no, ego no. being forceful 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 and you know maybe this lines up with me thinking that you know we are i have this theory that you know we are we are love and light mm. with a load of stories over the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the stories is where the ego is and that's mm. where the force comes from, but the power just comes from underneath. And yeah, it's just yeah. tapping into that. So that's why I was interested to ask you about your coaching because yeah. now it's almost like I'm getting a feeling that by having this experience that you can relate to, that the people that you coach you can help them tap them in tap into their power yep as opposed to force the force yeah, yeah exactly yeah, which yeah. is like yeah i know you really want to be doing a 5k set today because mm. you're halfway through your rottenness channel swim but just take a look at yourself yeah, like, yeah, yeah. i think you actually just need to go home or yeah. just watch a movie and i don't want to see you at the pool for the two days yeah and i know that's the last thing you want to do yeah. But I'm sending you out. You're banned from, banned from squad for two days. You know, totally. That's just yeah, hypothetically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they come back Friday and they're like, whoa, ready to go. And it's like, yeah, now yeah. look. And, ooh, and a performance spike. Yeah, yeah. Because we've worked with you. You know, I think sometimes, you know, the mind gets so, it's so forceful and it drags the body along. And then I think after a while, you know, the body then just goes, fuck, you're not listening to me. Yeah, no. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, Chuck a disc out now. Yeah, yeah, I've had totally. enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've totally had enough of this. Yeah. Because you upstairs, you just keep drive, 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 drive. And you're not listening. You're not smelling the roses. So yeah. guess what? I'm sticking the anchors on. Yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what happened, you know. And I think that would be a very good piece of advice just, just from what you said there about taking the two days off. You know, if you are thinking about any, if any of this is resonating and ringing a bit of a bell, you do need time and space to actually see some of that, you yeah. know. So... I, Michelle went over to Canada. I was left, um, this was after I got back from Mallorca when I was still in a bit of a bad way. And she was, she'd already got a pre-booked holiday over there to go and see a friend who's getting married. So I was here with the kids by myself uh, and with a very good friend, Sue, who luckily lived in with us and did uh, did all the hard yards with the, with the kids. So it made my life a lot better. Um, but I was working full time as well. And I, I just arranged it one weekend I thought I just need to get away, and I went to stay with a friend Amanda down in uh, in Albany, and I, I literally left. I left my phone here. I left. I, I took the crappy little Nissan down down there without any sort of um, well, no communication. Some one of my friends who I thought was a fairly sort of. Um, you know, uh, DIY sort of guy he says, "Well, what, what are you going to do if you break down?" I was like. I'll thumb a lift or I'll do what you used I'll to in the old day. Out. I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. And I'm not te- I'm not DIY minded at all sort of thing. I definitely don't know how an engine works and stuff like that. Yeah. But I, I just wanted to separate myself completely from all of this stuff. And you know, this is when I was starting to think I'm going to draw back from social media a little bit because it's almost like, and, and the phone as well. It, if, there, if I'm a workaholic, then the phone itself, yeah. when I'm away trigger, on trigger, holiday, trigger. it's a trigger, trigger, trigger. And, it's, and that is the... That is the portal to my workaholism. Is actually having this handheld device. Oh, so accessible! So, yeah, yeah, so accessible. So I just left it, and I drove down there. Had two brilliant nights down there, and we just went, you know, went walking on the hills and had a couple of nice cocktails and stuff like that. Yeah. But it was all just there was no uh, no devices, no nothing. It was just, and it, in many ways, those two nights were what that week in Bremen Bay should have been because yeah. I was sort of preparing myself to leave all that stuff and. Gonna do. I never got the chance to do that, but uh, we've decided we're going to go and do a um, a fuck it family holiday, this, <laughs> family holiday. This, this Christmas because it's uh, the, the the final part of all of this to get some perspective. So the guy who friend who keeps saying send me this thing, so make sure you keep it in perspective. Don't over dramatize and stuff. I said, trust me, with what's just happened last in the last couple of weeks, 
my perspective is totally perspective radar is bang where it needs to be because yeah. um, unfortunately for, for those of you listening um, two weeks ago my uh, 10 year old son was knocked down by a, yeah. a car crossing the road and um, I'll, I'll start off by saying he's okay now he spent three nights in uh, in hospital and it was quite you know they thought he'd broken his neck and uh, got severe concussion they thought it was bleeding on the spleen all these and just seeing you a 10 year old son in that yeah position you know being unconscious on the road um and then spending this time in hospital it was it's a very sort of life affirming sort of mm. uh feeling when you know that you're through the the worst of it and and he's going to be okay and he's he's going to move forwards and stuff and it was I, I i can't believe i can't begin to tell how that night it was a friday afternoon and all of this stuff that I've been dealing with, like the like the challenging of the, the ego thing and trying to be less competitive and trying to just sniff and smell the roses a little bit more. And, you know, it sounds crazy that like tomorrow morning I'll coach 120 people and I'll interact with 120 people. It's not like I interact with a couple and then forget mm. about everyone. I interact with everybody. So it saps a huge amount of energy. So the notion that I wouldn't be, if I describe myself as not really a people person, a lot of people wouldn't believe that. They think, oh, what are you talking about? You talk, But... That's yeah. what pe- what I need to recognise, and people will no doubt realise as well, is that that's my professional life. Yes, that is what I have to do. That is what I am as a coach. But when I come home, I'm very withdrawn. I'm very insular, sort of thing. So yeah. I don't often catch up with friends, and I don't often uh, put myself out there and stuff like that. And I, I'll, I'll either be telling myself it's because I need to rest and get ready for work in the morning, or because I need to work now before going to work in yeah. the morning and stuff like that. So I don't have much of a social life and since making these changes I have tried to pay a lot more heed to that and I have been trying to go out more mm. and, and do this and I'm definitely enjoying life a lot more. And on that particular evening, that Friday evening, we went across the road to some friends. We were having a gin and tonic sundowner with um, parents of other kids who go to the school and it was like a very idyllic thing. There was about 10 adults sat around drinking gin and tonics, 20 little kiddies playing around on the grass, turf and stuff like that and you know it's a lovely calm evening and stuff and three of the kids my boy included um were banging around a soccer ball they love playing soccer and he, he's and i said oh, guys you need to go down the field with that and you know otherwise you're going to smash a window or something like that just make sure you're back before dark so they toddled off so it was my idea for them to go down and yeah. do that and um apparently they said that when they were crossing the traffic lights it was making a funny noise and it was the same day that they yeah. had forty thousand units or businesses without power and they were changing all the power lines around the corner around here so they were actually they actually heard a fault in the traffic light when they went across and played their soccer came back at dusk and jackson thought it was okay to cross the road but the, the cars were seeing green at the same time as well and he crossed and got cleaned up by a car and uh, yeah. and hit the deck hard and, and he's unfortunately his two mates he was with saw him flip up in the air and and uh, and hit the deck hard like that so it was we got the phone call um, so we sat there having this idyllic evening. I'm relaxing into my new self <laughs> yes. uh, and just saying, thinking, and I was smelling the roses. I was genuinely sat there smelling the roses thinking, I don't need to worry about work tonight. I'm not even going to take my phone. I'm just going to relax and just enjoy other people's company and not get distracted and look at all the little kiddies. They're all playing. The-. And I was thinking, this is fantastic. It's wonderful. Yeah. And then we get the phone call and I've seen this look on Michelle's face only once prior. And that was when it was about five, six years ago. She came running down the stairs at the old house and she says, my brother's got cancer. Right. And Michelle is, well, she's an absolute rock in terms of her emotional stability. She doesn't have ups and downs like I have. She's a lot yeah. more stable. So to hear her at that point, five, six years ago, say my brother's got cancer and see the look and shock in her face, it was quite a scary thing seeing. And I've only seen that look once before. And, and then I saw it last couple of Fridays ago. Jack, yeah. There's been an accident. We've got to go. We were around the corner. I knew straight away what that accident might have been because the kids were coming back, supposedly yeah. coming back before dark. Um, and we were sure enough, we were running around the corner with all the ambulances and the tra- and the police there and, and stuff. And, and your little boy is laying in the way that yeah. somebody had actually moved him. They probably shouldn't have done, but they moved him onto the side of the road. And you know, and he's in a he's in a bad way, and he's all banged up. And it was very very hard to to see that. So we've just thought fuck it <laughs> we're going to yeah. go this fuck it family holiday excellent and um, you know we're going to take four weeks off over Christmas we're going to go and see family in Vancouver Toronto England and then go a little bit of skiing in Sweden as well awesome. and 
you know, it's it's a it, it, it's a it's a holiday which I probably in the past would have thought we we can't afford to do that, both yep. in terms of time and finances. Um, but we just sort of thought, you know, fuck it, let's go and do it and go on that. Go and, go and soak that up. Yeah. So if you right, I'm gonna ask you one last question there. Yeah, yeah. And this is uh, this question I ask all my guests at the end. If you take everything that you've that that that's been occurring and this, that, and the other. And what I ask my guests is, if you could take one little nugget and upload it into the collective consciousness so everyone just gets it, what would that be? Ooh, it's very, very tough. Very tough indeed. I think, I think for me personally, certainly with the story that I've been sharing here, it's, it's a story about how much work is enough and you know, some people might be listening to this and thinking, well, I need to work 60 hours a week because I need to, you know, because I'm in a lower income job and I need to do that because otherwise I'll be out on the street type of thing. But I think for, for me, the, the nugget which I, would, which I would give is just make sure that, you know, make sure you're doing it for all the right reasons. And I, I think one of the, I haven't been doing it for the right reason in the sense that I have had that ego behind wanting to grow and wanting to be bigger and wanting to be better and thinking I'm going to be happier when I'm more successful. And But where how big does it have to be for it to be successful and for me to be happy and stuff? And, and I, I think the nugget that I take from that or try to give to that is that in terms of mine and Michelle's relationship specifically, it took... She has said not a single thing that I've said to you today. She hasn't been saying to me for the last sixteen years. <laughs> She's been telling me all of this. She dropped you a big to- told you so. She, yeah. No, she didn't. No, <laughs> but I but I gave her the permission to. I gave her the told you so. So yeah. one morning I just stopped and just said, "Look, you were totally right about everything," and I apologized. I apologized because I didn't. I wasn't listening to her. I wasn't yeah. listening to the warning that she was saying and other friends were saying and I was in many ways I was actually flipping it around thinking their warning is me boosting my ego thinking I'm Superman because I can do what they can't do yes you know I can you need to calm down because you're working too hard but I'm managing it I'm not falling apart therefore I must be Superman that's the story I was telling myself so it's only by sort of going through this process and then more importantly not just recognizing it myself but then I, I have gone through this process of apologizing I felt like there's there's old girlfriends that I've been contacting in the last couple of months to apologize for how what my behavior was like with them in the distant past a girl, a girl who I was with 20 years ago completely out of the blue I just I thought I need to speak to her and I need to tell her that my behavior with her wasn't right and I yeah. apologise and I apologise to Michelle and I said you were so right with everything and they, and you know and I, I can't fix it and I don't expect you to um, suddenly mm-hmm. suddenly jump to that but I want you to know that I can now see it I can now see myself in what I've been doing and I'm going to try and work on improving I'm going to try and fix it it's not going to be an easy thing to do um, but, but that's what I'm trying to do just, but you can't see yourself like that I, it's taken for me it's taken a life life changing get, thing getting cracked <laughs> for me to get cracked you know and again back pain how much of a life change it's not like I died or, or sorry it's not like I had cancer or, or something like that or it was on, on, on death's doorstep but it was it was that which then sort of said okay well these other things might be in your future unless you change something right now mm. and recognising that in myself and then more importantly I felt a lot of freedom by actually then saying to people who I've probably put out in the past and and haven't been the nicest with them and say look you were right or I was sorry or you know and I don't expect to start again with them necessarily but mm. but I'm trying to I'm trying to atone yeah I'm trying to be a, be, a yeah. better a better better person you know and go from there so yeah so that's that's what's been going on Bryn <laughs> that's absolutely awesome I uh, I feel very privileged that you've shared that with me. Um, I do not think your story, you know, the details of your story are yours. Yes. But the underlying process of your story, I think, goes on. I know goes on. Yeah. And, you know, and the, the details might change and the way it manifests and the backache might not be a backache. Mm. It might be something else. But it goes on. 
Yeah. And and as a very human story, and I think more and more need to be told. I fundamentally believe this is the best thing that's ever one of the best things that's ever happened to you. Yeah. As, yeah. Your, yeah. as your coach in Czech yeah, yeah. said that. And um I can't help feeling that this will make you an even better coach in a way that I don't think you can even see at this point. At this point, yeah. yeah. And one thing's for sure, I won't be measuring that in terms of does that give me 20,000 20, more no, followers or no. anything? Because I think that's been, a, that's been a very sage reminder about, you know, okay, well, I'm going to have to change my parameters of what success looks like. Looks like, you mm. know, it doesn't and, look like that. And one of the interesting things, like, not, you know, um, for me personally has been just almost it's almost like a piece of advice at the end is that for ages you know I grew up in a very elitist mm. boys boarding school and, and excellence was handed down to me it's only through doing WA Real and going oh I'll have a bit of that and I'll have a bit of that and I'll have yeah, a bit of that yeah. that I define what excellence looks like for me and it's mm. it's super liberating when you define what success looks like yeah so awesome yeah. I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, what well, would that be? Number two hundred eighteen. If we keep something today. like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. But Paul, thank you very, very much for no taking the time. Reach out and 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 sharing that it means a lot. Good work. Cool. Cool.